Uh, yes, so this afternoon we will be covering the multiple operational budgets for the Parks Department. Uh, the director of the Parks Department, Mr. Ray Maurer, is here to present his operations budget as well as he does have several CIP items. So I'll turn it over to Mr. Maurer. Thank you and thanks council and uh, Mr. Mayor. Um, been watching a little bit of the, the, the departments this morning and yesterday and uh, we'll try to keep it smoothly flowing for you. And if you have questions, obviously we're, we're gonna be here to answer those. We'll go through um, the various divisions that are within my department. I do have my supervisory staff who will be joining me. So um, they'll be talking about some of the good things that they've done this past year as well as what they're looking at for next year. Um, we're gonna start out with the Parks General Fund. Um, Chad Dahlman is on vacation in Canada this week, so we'll be taking care of um, the parks budget and a couple other ones that Chad's been involved with. But um, the parks budget, at least some of the highlighted items from, this is on page 177, to talk about that we've um, accomplished or are finishing up. Um, the Tech Miller Park restroom renovation, if the council recalls, one of the major items that we heard in our comprehensive plan um, that we updated back in 2011 was citizens really wanted to see the, the restrooms updated throughout our facility. Um, and the council and the city manager have been very supportive of trying to do one restroom at least a year. Um, and what we do as far as the renovations, um, typically our staff will go in and demolish the interior. We use the building shell, um, and then we hire a contractor to come in and make it ADA accessible, uh, more energy efficient, um, you know, sensors on lights, sensors on plumbing fixtures. Um, so. That's what we've been trying to do, and this year was uh, Tech Miller Park, and that project is, um, I believe, finishing up now. Within the last couple of weeks, we did playground, new playground installations at CSAN and Sailorland at Menominee Park and Fugelberg Park. Um, the one at CSAN and Sailorland, we did work with the Neighborhood Association to do some fundraising for that, along with the Community Foundation. Um, so that was a, um, a joint project, again, with Planning Division and some of the, the Healthy Neighborhood Initiatives that um, go through the budget. Um, what we've started to do on all our new playgrounds is we're putting the, the pour in place rubber surfacing, similar to what we did at South Park at the inclusive playground. Um, it's really a lot more accessible for individuals that might be in wheelchairs or walkers or grandparents to get out and, and be able to traverse the, the playground with their grandkids. Um, it's a little more expensive on the front end, but it doesn't require us in the future to continually replace the wood mulch that gets um, typically kicked away from the swings and the slides. So um, hopefully in the next number of years, you're gonna see our um, line item in our operating budget for that wood fiber going down because we're um, putting in this port in place surfacing. And it's a lot safer, it's a lot more conducive if people fall off the equipment. <coughs> um, the other large project we've been working jointly with um, stormwater management and engineering is the South Park Lagoon project. Um, that project obviously is going on now and is anticipated anticipated to be completed um, early next spring into the summer. We're shooting for early part of June um, for that completion. Um, one item that I wanted to make sure everybody was aware of is we've always had a memorial bench program. We've done a better job of promoting that. And um, this past year we installed five new benches. And um, what individuals can do or service clubs is it's a $1,500 donation to the department and that pays for the bench, the concrete base that it goes on, and then we put a, a plaque on the bench, um, whether in memorial of somebody or again, recognizing um, service clubs. So what we've done is tried to promote that a little bit more. Um, a lot of those go um, into Menominee Park. Um, you'll notice a number of those located along the shoreline and it obviously helps us to stay out of our operating budget. Um, our guys will internally do that installation in the concrete work. So it's a it's a win-win for individuals that would like to have some type of memorial. And then we are currently working on the um, construction and the, the, the award was, or the bid was just awarded recently for the Mary Jewel restroom pump station. Um, and we'll be working with that project. Some objectives for next year. Um, there's a number of items if we, um, when we get into the capital improvement plan, um, some improvements at Fugelberg Park, that would be the restroom that we're proposing to renovate. Um, South Park, again, working to enhance the, uh, the project over there and the amenities in the park. Um, the great neighborhood projects, which have been recently approved by the council. Um, there's the ball diamond at Tech Miller Park that we'll be looking to reconstruct over there. Um, some uh, work at Stevens Park and the Sawyer Creek Trail Roosh Park on the west side by Carl Traeger. Um, we're currently working with Rettler Corporation to do a park master plan, um, working with the neighborhood association as well as the parks board over there. So you're going to start to see that 
coming to fruition over the next couple of months. They're doing some mapping work over there. Um, sorry, sorry, did, yes. what, what did you say the Stevens Park piece was? Stevens Park is, I believe, um, it's some smaller items, some tree identification signs, oh, okay. as well as, I believe, um, possibly some bollards on the path. There's been an issue with cars driving through the park on the pathway, um, so we're looking to try to deter that, but then also make sure that our staff can get through those areas. Um, I think um, early on, early on in the summer, I think um, Council Member Palmieri had asked about some of the budget issues that she wants, wanted to be aware of coming forward, and I shared with all the council that um, for us being one of the departments that hire seasonal part-time people, um, one of the, the higher hiring people, is, it was very challenging this year. We've seen it the last couple of years, but this year was extremely challenging. Um, one, because the unemployment, unemployment rates are so low, um, but we're also seeing that our um, rates for our seasonal staff have, have lagged behind in some positions. Um, when we're seeing people posting for, um, whether it's a fast food um, in the industry or cashiers at um, an Aldi or a Walmart getting paid $10, $12 an hour, um, and we're paying people 7 to $9 an hour, it's really been difficult. Um, so what we're looking at in some of our um, budgets um, pool and some of the revenue facilities is we're going to be working with HR and doing some surveys and possibly increasing our um, seasonal pay, uh, potentially about a dollar an hour for some of those staff. Um, talking with Mr. Sturm, um, there's some staff that we have at the cemetery that have been returning and we want to make sure if we have those staff and want to have them coming back to make sure if it's a dollar an hour to keep them coming back versus having to hire new staff. Um, so we'll be working with HR on that and you'll see there's some um, in our seasonal budgets, you're going to see that there's some increases proposed there. Um, but that's really been our biggest challenge this year. And then again, I, um, I noted in here on the parks, if you individual line item landscaping supplies, that's mainly due to the wood fiber that's specifically manufactured to go under the playgrounds. And we have been working with the city manager and the council to try to get that increased every year because that's some way, um, an area that we haven't been doing such a good job. And we um, continually hear and see from people that we need to uh, stay on top a little bit more of, the, of putting the wood mulch in the playgrounds. Um, Ray, just on a, along those lines, someone had asked me recently, and I couldn't answer them, do we use um, mulch that comes out of the city brush um, chipper for that? Not that this um, the mulch for under the playgrounds is actually um, it's specifically manufactured over in the New London area because it has to be free of bark and nails and other shrapnel or other items that might come through the chipper at a at a uh, city facility. Okay. So this is all clean, um, and it actually is, it's a mulch that meshes together to almost make a matting after gotcha. after a period. So no, we, we can't use it in the playgrounds, but we do utilize some of that in some of our shrub beds and some other areas throughout the city. Okay, thanks. That really covers what I wanted to talk about on, on the parks budget. Um, there were a couple of Uh, a couple items that we did do, and one, and one in particular, if you want to look at the personnel page, um, this this past year we um, had an individual that transferred over from our department from the water distribution department to the parks after we had a retirement, and this individual was one that uh, came out on top of our candidate list, and he actually is a journeyman plumber, um, so we are utilizing this individual to do a lot more of our plumbing work not only in our department, but we have offered him up to all the other departments through the city. Um, so that I know this individual has helped out at the museum. Um, he's helping out with John Urban and Terry Smith throughout City Hall, the convention center. Um, and what we've done as part of that is we're actually contracting out less services. Um, so we have worked with Trina and Mark to um, reduce some of our contracted services budget along with some of the other departments. Again, utilizing our staff across <coughs> departments to um, to get some of that plumbing done in-house. So we're working with this individual to um, attain his master plumber license, hopefully in the next couple of months, so he can take on some additional responsibilities doing those in-house um, for the, the various departments. And I think that's really been working out great for us and um, an area that I think we need to continue to grow on sharing our staff. So I wanted to make sure and highlight that item for you. Oh, sorry. Oh, no, go ahead. On, on the seasonal help, uh, 6103. Um, so it looks like that's only estimated to go up $100. How is that going to cover 
Would you reduce the number and go up higher on the hourly? Or Yes, that is correct. Okay. Um, in this area, because if you recall last year, we, um, through the budget process, added one full-time position by reducing some of those numbers. We would try to keep that number consistent or slightly less by adding, um, potentially increasing their salary in this area. And as I said, once we get into um, some of the other other budgets where we couldn't do that, you're going to see that there's going to be an increase in that seasonal budget. Are there any other questions? The Parks does have a number of uh, VIP projects that we could step into next then. Those items start on page 26. Okay. Um, just prior to... Uh, us kicking off this afternoon I did share with you the Advisory Parks Board prioritized list that is something the Parks Board does annually so you'll have that in front of you um, and what we try to do is take a look at um, all our projects that are incorporated our comprehensive outdoor recreation plan as well as our individual park plans for Menominee Park South Park and Rainbow Park uh, we try to tackle some of the high priority projects some of those projects may get shifted around um, due to maybe user groups helping to fund a project or available grant funding. So we take a look at a number of items. Um, I'm on page 26, as, as Trina had said. Um, one of the, the top projects for us at this point is um, renovating the Menominee Park tennis courts. Um, we have met with um, a number of the tennis court users along with the Neighborhood Association, and they are very supportive of this project, and the courts are in, in need of replacement. Um, we've also talked with, and you've probably heard, that pickleball is one of the big and upcoming and um, uh, very popular now. What we're doing is possibly working at reducing the number of tennis courts and incorporating some pickleball courts. Um, I've had a meeting with um, representatives from the local pickleball group as well as the tennis players, and they all feel that um, doing so would alleviate some of the concerns they're having with um, space. So we're working on a current design that would incorporate some pickleball courts there. Um, can I just ask a dumb question here? What's the difference between the tennis court and the pickleball court? Um, the size of the court, the height of the net, um, the pickleball courts, we're looking at having some fencing to keep it a little more contained, some of the lower level fencing. And that'll take, you'll take a look at Rainbow Park. They've done that kind of internally in their small group, but really it's the court size and the height of the tennis or the, the net itself. The, you can, um, you can stripe courts so that they're multi-use, but in talking with the user groups, um, it becomes an issue with them. And if there's potential grant funding out there through whether a tennis association, a national tennis association, or a pickleball, um, they do not typically fund projects where you're using um, multi-sport striping. So that's another reason why we are separating them out as okay. well. Okay. So that kind of leads me to another question along those lines. Someone had called earlier this week about the skateboard park and whether or not, I guess, because currently it's no scooters allowed, and I guess <clears throat> relating to changing in trends in multi-use space, the question became, you know, well, well why are the um, scooters not allowed? Because apparently that's a new trend with older kids or something. And I, and I guess I asked that question because are we with Rettler leaning more towards doing where we can multi-use um, equipment and spaces yeah and we're actually doing that with um, not only the tennis courts pickleball but with our youth and our adult softball and baseball fields what we're now doing is making the infield the outside arc of the infield larger so that we can have multiple um, base lengths from 55 up to 90 foot base lengths so that you can put um, a various various age groups and abilities on those so yes to address your question a lot of those areas are being made more multi-use for us. Uh, moving down the list, we have Spanbauer field improvements. And this is one that we really haven't made some major improvements into some of our um, fields that are used by the adult sports. Um, I do have a letter from Al Wenig from the Rec Department and the Softball Commission supporting this project. Um, they have not committed funding, but I said that we would be looking, um, if you take a look, the entire project, we're looking at about $250,000, and um, we're hoping to raise about $50,000 of that amount. Um, my anticipation is that we'll be reaching out to the, um, the Softball Commission as well as some of the other user groups to help with some of that fundraising. Um, and this is a field that was the primary field in the past, 
uh, for the adult sports. Um, right now it's primarily used by the women's softball, co-ed softball, and the rec department then offers kickball in the fall. Um, but a lot of the youth sports also take place here throughout the week. So it's a heavily used diamond, um, but it is in, in need of some repairs, uh, the fencing, as well as the infield and some other areas. Next item is South Park, the play equipment and surfacing. This would be the um, existing um, older structure that is um, between the restroom facility and the new inclusive playground. When this came up at the Parks Board, this wasn't as high on my list, but then the Parks Board member said with the improvements we're making to South Park with the lagoons as well as the new restroom, it'd be really nice to, um, to keep working on South Park and get this project completed so that we're um, really focusing on getting a number of items done at South Park. The next item is the Fugelberg boat launch, the restrooms update. Um, these, a number of these Fugelberg projects, you're gonna see some grant funding there. And um, through the planning division and economic development, um, they had received a grant a couple of years back from the um, DNR for some recreational boating facilities. And if you recall, when the boat works project was going on, there was discussion of a possible boat launch in that site. And it was determined that because of the depth of the water and the amount of dredging that would take place, um, that that became financially infeasible. Um, so um, Darlene Brandt and planning has worked with the DNR. And as long as um, we're able to utilize that grant funding at other boating facilities, um, the DNR was willing to let us change the scope for that dollar amount. Um, and it's about $225,000 in grant funding that they have committed to these projects. So I worked with Darlene, and so when you see a state, a state grant, that money is actually coming from a grant that has already been committed to Oshkosh um, boating facilities. So at the Fugelberg restrooms, we would intend to use um, a portion of that to um, renovate the restroom facility. Moving on down, um, there's, it's always been a plan of the cities to add another boat ramp to the Fugelberg boat launch for some of the larger boats. Um, if you've launched there, there's a breakwater that really limits the size of the boats that can go in and out of that ramp. Um, so we would look at adding a ramp that would possibly allow some of the additional, um, the larger boats. Um, and we'll be reaching out to some of the, um, some of the fishing clubs as well as some of the other um, user groups to possibly help fund some of the donation along with that grant opportunity. And then the final item on page 27 is to um, update the lighting at the boat launch. Um, again, annually we've been requesting an, a, um, a park that we can update the lighting. We work with um, Mr. Kusman and the electric division to switch these over to LED lights and the consistent lights that we've been using throughout the parks. So as long as we had this grant, grant funding available, we felt that um, utilizing at the boat launch this year would um, be the appropriate site to utilize those funds at. Are we using any of the uh, boat launch revenue fees on any, um, any of these? At this point, I'm going to have to look back because I need to look where Trina is. Because those fees can be specifically used at boat launches and in improvements, correct? Yep. We are not for these, but when we get into the um, our park facilities revenue budget, we're going to be talking about some um, electronic pay stations. And there is where we're looking to transfer some of the dollars from the boat launch fund and start utilizing those for those pay stations. So these capital items on this page, um, we are not tapping the boat launch fund at this point. Yeah. With regard to the restrooms at Menominee Park, <clears throat> the beach house more specifically, um, is that something in the other fund that you're just referring to or is that anywhere in our CIP? The restrooms where, I'm sorry? Um, restrooms at uh, the beach, well, the beach house slash restrooms at Menominee Beach. Yeah, that... Um, where is that falling? That would be in our operation budget it because it is not um, high on the list at this point in the CIP list okay. um, or in the, the Menominee Park plan. Uh, but that is something I know there's some, some improvements we need to do down at the, the bathhouse restrooms, um, and we'll take care of that in-house in our operation budget. Okay. Um, the final item it will be on page 30 at this point for projects, which is the renovation of the Riverwalk, which is adjacent, adjacent to the Leach Amphitheater. Um, this project is necessary become it, because it's really become a trip hazard back there. When the, this Riverwalk was installed in the early 2000s, um, 
there's the seawall, which is um, a containment area basically for the soils on the site, and um, we, are, we cannot do anything with that seawall without having WPS's permission um, because we don't want to disrupt the integrity of that wall and allow any um, contaminated soil to get into the river. Um, when this sea, or when the river walk was put into place, the concrete walkway was not attached or secured to the, uh, the seawall, and what's happening is it's being undercut from all the uh, water coming off the hillside behind the leach. So it's actually the river walk has sunk down. There's areas that are anywhere from three to four inches um, where it's sunk and becomes a trip hazard. Um, so we've worked uh, initially right now with AECOM as well as WPS to come up with an initial design where we would go in and remove um, that section of the river walk concrete, come back in, um, reinforce the base, and then what we would do is put a, um, a brace on the back of the seawall where the concrete walkway would actually attach to the seawall so it, this would not happen in the future. It's the same design that they've been using in other areas of the river walk where there is a seawall. Essentially there's an L bracket that goes onto the back of the seawall that the concrete sits on so it doesn't shift if the, um, the base course starts to erode. Um, some good news on this, you can see we're um, anticipating a state grant of $92,000. Um, Ann Schaefer, who's our marketing and fund developer, wrote two grants. Um, we recently received notification that we were successful in receiving $45,000 at this point. And the other one um, was for a stewardship grant through the DNR. Um, and they could not commit funds to any project until the state budget was signed, um, which recently happened. So we're hoping that the remainder of that, uh, the $47,000 roughly, may come from um, the stewardship grant, so we would have approximately 50% of this project funded through grant through the um, through the DNR at this point. I had a question on the um, tennis court reconstruction and the CIP book. It says the project totals 300,000, but on your request summary, it's 420,000. Yes, what we did through the the CIP process and after meeting with the tennis and pickleball players, the 420 included um, adding new lights at the courts. Um, talking with the groups, they really felt that at this point, they really need to get the tennis courts in. And as we met through the CIP process, we re, um, reduced the scope of the project. Um, we'll probably put all the conduit in for the lighting in the future. And then in some future budget year, we may come back and add the $120,000 to $130,000 for the lights. <clears throat> you want to go right into equipment right away, as long as we're here? Perfect. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to have Bill help on this one because he has met with Chad on. For your question. Yes. <clears throat> this morning, um, Scooter was talking about some lighting stuff down at the Riverwalk, and a question came up about the condition of the lights and everything. And it was, Scooter felt the, the bigger problem wasn't vandalism, but people using the bollards as um, tying up their bow tie-ups. Tie -ups. Mm -hmm. um, should I think the question came up and I because I jotted it down was we need any additional ordinance or regulation that gives you some enforcement or gives the police enforcement ability we forgot to ask chief when he them. was in about or signage that you know basically says do not tie up to the lights or something we um, we've worked with the local boat club and they will actually put signage out there um, during some of the large the water fest events um, we have a staff member on at the leach <laughs> that we have now instructed to go up and down the river walk and if they see people tying off um, to ask them to remove it. Um, and again, back to the boat club, they typically have a couple of their boats down there and they are actually doing patrolling for us on those busy nights as well. Um, we have had some temporary signs put up, but it's an area where it's difficult to put permanent signs up down there saying do not tie up. Back to the question about an ordinance, we do have an ordinance on the books ready that if they damage city property or park property um, that they can be cited for that. Um, I'm hoping that by having our staff member go up and down the river walk during those large events and during our Tuesday night concerts, that will help out. Um, but yes, it is a problem and those lights, those bollards are thirteen to $1,500 a piece, I believe, so they're very expensive. Do so you think it's enough if they <clears throat> are told you got to tie up somewhere. I think so. We can look at alternatives of putting some signs somewhere. Um, a lot of the times, signage is not the answer, but it, no, we can write them a ticket. But they, yeah, they and we do, have, we do have we do have because sometimes the people you have enforcing that are are young kids, and they might just say, you know, 
but we do have the police. We do have the police on site for all those events as well. So if it gets to that point, we could bring an officer in. Um, we can take a look at it, but I think we currently do have the ordinance in effect that if it's something's damaged, we can go back after the those individuals. Okay. So. Uh, page 38 is the major equipment. Um, we have a step van, and I don't know, Bill, hopefully you're going to have more information, but essentially this replaces one of our um, existing vehicles. Or um, Our step vans are essentially the large utility vans that our trades techs will take out onto a project site. Um, they're loaded with their tools and equipment that they need so that there's not a, a need for coming back and forth to the shop. Um, this is replacing our, our existing truck number 425. And then the other one is um, a zero turn mower um, with seasonal attachments. Um, what we have done is these are pretty much all season vehicles. Um, they're zero turn mowers for mowing during the mowing season. And then we can trans, um, transform those into snowblower units. They essentially are called polar tracks. We put tracks on for snow removal um, during the winter months. So we're replacing one of those um, with a number of older pieces of equipment you can see that we're getting rid of. If there's any specific questions on those, those, and we provide um, Trina and Mark with, you know, the, the ongoing maintenance costs that we've seen over the last couple of years as well as years, and um, because these are multi-season pieces of equipment as well. And the I, ones you're replacing, those are getting traded in? And that's reducing the cost, or are they getting reused or, res or sold? Um, yeah, these will yeah. typically get traded in. For the zero-turn tractor, we're actually trading in three older units and replacing it with one. Um, that's a multi-purpose piece of equipment and uh, the step van has had you know quite extensive repairs that have been needed over the past three years so it's uh, uh, we have to pay th for, th for that through our operations budget so we're, we're trying to alleviate some of those future repairs by replacing the vehicle okay <clears throat> So that would wrap the capital improvement projects for the parks department so then we would be at page 182 uh, to lead off with the forestry <coughs> division I'm gonna turn it over to Bill and he can talk about some of the accomplishments and objectives coming up okay thank you uh, we've had a pretty exciting year this year uh, we started off we received a $25,000 Wisconsin DNR urban forestry grant which allowed us to do um, multiple things. Um, the emphasis was on diversification of our tree canopy because uh, as many of you know, with um, you know, the danger to our ash trees, um, we wanted to make sure that we had multiple species out there um, in, in the area. So we, we were actually able to work with, uh, with planning and uh, partnered with the neighborhood associations and we did uh, planting. Um, that was quite extensive and then we also uh, through that grant also did uh, four workshops that were uh, designed mainly for the general public to give them uh, information regarding tree care so that was uh, conducted by a certified arborist that we had under contract to uh, to assist us with that uh, and those went over quite well they were well attended um, through that program uh, we also um, offered trees to folks on private property because we also have an interest in making sure that um, people are, are remembering to plant on their own properties aside from what we do in the city. Uh, the other uh, piece of that grant was also that we had uh, some extra dollars to work on emerald ash borer uh, mitigation and treatment. So uh, we normally try to treat about 300 trees a year. So. Um, this grant also allowed us to uh, to treat some additional trees that we thought were worth saving. Um, so we actually treated over 570 trees this summer. So um, the treatment that we use is actually good for three years. So this buys us, you know, some time. Um, we're still removing some of the ash trees that are in poor condition or are associated with sidewalk work or curb or infrastructure problems so uh, we have removed some of them that um, were problematic anyway uh, but the bulk of them we're, we're trying to save um, as best we can through the treatment scenario which is working quite well um, the other accomplishments we've done this year is we updated chapter 26 of the municipal code which covers forestry issues and i think most of you are aware of that um, 
We uh, also do a lot of the landscaping on city properties. So a couple projects that we had been working on with planning and the neighborhood associations include uh, the completion of these uh, Chief Oshkosh Monument landscape restoration and improvements. Uh, so through that uh, project, we uh, put in some sidewalks to uh, create some accessibility to the, the monument. And then we also did some plantings around that area and some restoration of some of the lawn areas. Uh, the previous winter, we had also removed a few of the uh, uh, trees that were causing obstruction to visibility of that statue that were in poor condition. So we did remove a few trees for that too that were in, in poor shape anyway. Um, we, uh, we have a complete inventory <coughs> of all of our street trees on the GIS. And so th uh, through that mapping uh, system, we were able to create uh, tree pruning mapping zones so this enables our crews to better uh, manage the, the routine maintenance that goes on with the street trees. So we established uh, uh, zones that uh, they will be working on in uh, each year for the next consecutive five years cycle. So uh, you know, we have a lot of trees that were added through the course of the taking root projects and other neighborhood improvement uh, tree planting. So uh, now we have a little uh, we're a little more capable of uh, addressing each individual tree in some of these areas uh, through our pruning and maintenance cycle. <clears throat> so we've also uh, been doing a lot of replacement through our with our own staff of trees that were taken out. So that's um, that program has been well received by the uh, the uh, folks in the community. So as we remove trees, we like to replace them, and uh, so with that. Uh, We've also added some into some other areas that, uh, that were outside of some of the neighborhood areas that we've been working with uh, primarily. Um, we've also um, got a couple grants um, th for tree planting. Uh, one of them is uh, th through a partnership with American Transmission Company, who is one of our utility companies here in th this community. And they have partnered with the Bucks. And so, th uh, they have a program with the Bucks currently that uh, every time uh, they shoot a three-point play, Oshkosh gets a tree. So um, we're fortunate to have developed that partnership here in Oshkosh, uh, given that we have the um, Wisconsin herd now in our community. Uh, we've uh, worked with ATC and trying to develop some projects that would be in the vicinity of the, uh, the sports complex. So uh, that's all been good news. Um, We've also done several other uh, landscape improvements too, which I forgot to mention earlier, which would include uh, the convention center. We did some rehab down there. Um, and then we've also, or I have also been working extensively with the uh, curb appeal project with the uh, Oshkosh for Education program, which was uh, kind of a big undertaking, but well received. Uh, we did uh, do quite a bit of tree planting on public property associated with some of the schools. And then uh, we were also uh, very closely involved in some of the planning of, of the landscape improvements on all of the school sites that were worked on during that, that project. <clears throat> Over all you would say that our forestry throughout the city is in pretty good shape. Yes. Um, on city-owned property mostly I'm talking about. Yeah. Um, we've, uh, as I said, you know, been doing a lot of replanting. Um, you know, we've, we're still kind of fighting the deficit from, you know, that 2001 storm that we mm -hmm. lost, you know, a lot of trees in the community. So I think through, you know, a lot of this public-private partnership, we've been able to, you know, fill in these trees, which was really not possible through our normal operational budget. So... Now, um, South Park, they took down a bunch of trees. Are we putting them back in, or is that part of the plan at South Park? They have whoever is doing the work plant the new trees. Um, what we did was any trees that were removed were um, either willows or mainly were willows and ash trees that were going to be removed. A number of the memorial trees, Bill worked with the contractors to relocate those. Um, but we are going to be looking to replace some of the trees as part of our, um, it, we have a nursery inventory as well as some of our planting budget as well. Okay. <coughs> I just wanted to, um, um, you know, Steve, you asked about the condition of the trees. I think um, one thing that Bill hasn't talked about is um, the forestry unit has four full-time staff, and uh, not only are we responsible for 
um, the city terrace trees throughout the city, but as Bill said, a lot of the um, public facilities and buildings, uh, his staff gets involved with designing and maintaining shrub beds throughout the parks, throughout city facilities, um, the roundabouts, the median plantings, um, all of those um, Bill tries to handle with his four staff members. Um, one thing that we developed, as Bill said, is this new uh, mapping for the, the city. Um, I think in the past we've been a little too reactive. If somebody called in with a tree complaint about needing trimming, um, I think we were reacting instead of being proactive. And by having a, a pruning map now, mm -hmm. we can show them which area of the city we're concentrating on each year. Um, if it's not a, a nuisance tree that has to be trimmed right away, we can let the citizen know, you know, it's planned for trimming next year. Um, but Bill makes that determination if it's something that needs to be addressed. Um, but what we're also doing, Bill and Chad are working um, more on pooling our employees, even though we have employees in forestry, parks, cemetery, um, we are looking at utilizing staff throughout all divisions. We've been doing that, but we're moving more and more towards um, really focusing on what needs to be done in the city. So over the winter months, um, the forestry crew is typically trimming trees. Four guys, you typically have one, possibly two small crews. Um, if it's not a snowy winter where our parks guys are being plowing or doing other events, we're now going to be having more guys from parks and cemetery doing tree trimming to try to get caught up. So it's um, something that Bill and Chad will be transforming to a little bit more. Okay, good. Um, Ray, uh, then would that also be uh, the public safety building on the Jackson Street side also be in the forestry's um, purview or where is that? Uh, facilities maintenance here at City Hall takes most of the maintenance responsibility for that. Um, we, when we have time, um, you know, we do assist with some of the renovations of some of those landscape beds. Um, you know, we try to develop them so that they're more maintenance friendly. Um, we do the tree trimming and that sort of thing adjacent to the building. Um, you know, that's that's kind of a big area and we'd hope to kind of get involved in that, but with we're spread pretty thin with sure. uh, our small crew and all the things that we're taking on. So, so if um, there were a couple of <clears throat> neighborhood um, associations in the vicinity that could coordinate something through your office to help with some of that, that's mm -hmm. more of a fall project, like those tree uh, or bush pruning type things in the Jackson Street area? Sure, yeah, um, you know, we would be open to partnering with neighborhood associations, of course, if there's interest in, you know, folks coming out to assist in some of those projects. It just seems like we've got some invasive stuff, like my height, like they probably were a little seedling, but now they're getting a little wacky over there. It, it was an area I know that um, it was an area that Bill had been asked to help them on this year, but because of some of the other projects, um, the convention center being one and Chief Oshkosh, he wasn't able to, to get to. Um, okay. So if it is something okay. they need help with, um, we do as, as much as we can, and maybe it's something we can help on next year. But definitely if there's neighborhood associations, um, we would work with them. We work with um, River East. They assist us down on the river walk. They help us with maintaining the, the flower plots, the flower plots, pots down there, um, collecting garbage throughout the summer. So there's many ways we can work with them. There's been talk from other groups about trying to get volunteers to do the roundabout plantings. Um, we would not be comfortable, and our risk manager is not comfortable with that. Um, it's, it's very unsafe for our staff, even being out there with a, a vehicle with a beacon on. Um, we do have a regular maintenance plan for the roundabouts. Uh, Bill has a, a, a maintenance plan set up. That his staff go in there at least once a month on a set day to try to clean up garbage and other things, and they'll do so as, as, a, as they can. But again, because they're stretched so far, and depending what the park staff are doing, it's, it's one of those that we get to as we can. So. One quick thing about the Chief Oshkosh Monument at Menominee Park. You know, I raised the five thousand dollars from a donor to do a bigger sign and we're having a have been having a heck of a time getting someone to write the, the copy. We've been working with the Menominee Nation at Kashina and I finally have someone from the university who's part of that nation who is now lighting a fire under their historian to get us the copy. So hopefully that can be done next year. Yep, we, we've been in sure. touch with Alexa from planning, and I know mm -hmm. she's been part of that. Yep. And we've got, um, I think there's a bench that we're waiting to get installed yet, so the bench and the mm -hmm. sign are the final two pieces of items. So Yeah, we're hoping to install both the bench and the sign, you know, at the same time so that it kind of is 
all under concrete and we wanted to copy in their words not our words sure but no delay okay with no further questions we'll move on to the senior center revolving fund page 185 so this is a smaller fund that has association uh, with the larger fund of the senior services you can step back. I'm gonna have um, Gene Wollerman come forward um, one of the accomplishments for mm -hmm. us this year was um, to hire a new senior center manager and Gene joined us back in February March I'm guessing January. up to January <laughs> um, and she's been doing a great job for us and um, I'm gonna let her touch on a couple of things that as far as accomplishments um, but Jean is um, her background is from the YMCA and um, older older adult programming um, so she's gonna talk about some ways that we're looking to expand the fitness offerings at the senior center and um, helping with more of that aging population coming in but um, as Trina said this the 201 account is really it's a, what we consider our programming account. It allows us to try new programs and help some other programs maybe offset the cost of others. It's really um, a revolving a fund for us. Um, it gives Jean and her staff some flexibility on, on trying new items. Um, so this is almost a, a money in, money out, but you can see that there is a fund balance that has been growing. Um, so Jean is looking to spend um, a little bit of that fund balance. If you look under the budget variances, um, there is some um, wood shop equipment that she has worked with the wood shop gentlemen to uh, to come together and they'd like to purchase. Uh, there was a donation, I believe, that offsets that cost as well. I'm looking for a better uh, projector or television for the Campbell Creek Room um, for the meetings that are held there as well as for trainings and other programs. But um, Gene, maybe you can go through some of the significant accomplishments and talk about the fitness items as well. And then the... The new fees, I did hand out your fee structure. Okay. I guess I'll just start with some of the accomplishments that we've been doing so far. Um, when I came in January, there was a flooring project that was starting. So all of the south building and the um, offices in the, uh, in the north building were a new carpet was placed and also some of the painting that was done also. And some new heating and cooling units were being replaced during that time frame. Uh, the Committee on Aging moved out of the Senior Center and is now under the city, so the Committee on Aging has been meeting here. They went through a st strategic plan, which has kind of guided them into the future, which has been a wonderful feat for them. Um, we've also, uh, we're starting to get our fitness staff a little more <coughs> certified in different classes and different off so that we can get them into uh, new classes starting in the 2018 year and then with Ann's help we've been doing a lot of um, writing grant writing and getting some more sponsorships and grants uh, going into the senior center so, so right now know? for that fund um, there's just an estimated 4,000 for next year in grants is that right in that yes <clears throat> and also in that fund we're also looking when we move into more of the fitness changes um, we're also looking to add more fitness equipment that will um, not replace but add some new strength training pieces of equipment because there's a line of equipment that um, I've had seniors work on for years and years through the the Y system that is a really a user friendly type of strength equipment. It's a series that we have four pieces so far that we purchased this year and looking to add another four for next year and a total of an of an 11 uh, strength training series. So with that, should I just go into the fitness? Yeah, why don't um, I guess I just want to step back and and remind the council that. Um, this past year, Fox Valley Technical College um, did not renew their lease with us. They had been offering a number of programs there. And then as part of their um, uh, direction from the state, um, they were asked to increase the fee for some of their programs, and they found that it just was not going to be well attended. So they um, did not renew their lease with us, so we lost about $10,000, $15,000 $15, in rental revenue. 
Um, so again, going back to what Gene has been working with Ann on is reaching out to other businesses as far as sponsoring programs, um, coming into the senior center to um, talk about whether it's a, a local hospital or a local um, business that the seniors can benefit from. Um, so they're really trying to close that gap, but you can also see in the tax levy, um, we are requesting an additional tax levy to help offset some of that loss. Um, but then what Gene is looking to do in the, um, the Campbell room, which is in the, the north building where Fox Valley Tech really used a lot of that room, is we're going to work internally to make that more of an expanded fitness area. So if you want to talk about that, and then you could go through your fees maybe as well. Okay. So in combination with the fee change that we have to do through the, um, on, the back, on the back side for the exercise in the Fox Fitness area, um, we had the opportunity, um, and well, in 2016, the center had contracted through um, Trivity Health, which is a, uh, they, they have um, a fitness benefit for people on a Medicare, which is called Silver Sneakers. The, that contract could only allow participants to participate either in a exercise or, um, or the Fox Fitness Center. And in order for us to offer classes and trainings through Silver Sneaker Program, you had to actually um, make your fee a one, one fee for people when they came into the facility. Very similar to a lot of private places and the YMCA's. Mm -hmm. Also, we had the opportunity this year to sign on to two other um, organizations that offer fitness benefits for Medicare recipients. And in order to do that too, we had to have one fee that um, was attached to the individuals as they um, were able to participate in the fitness programs. So with that, we needed to consolidate what was currently offered in our fees as two separate fees into one fee. So as you can see, that is proposed for 2018. Um, we ha already contracted through the three entities to offer <coughs> the fitness benefits. So a lot of insurances for Medicare recipients, um, for example, uh, Network Health, United Healthcare, Blue Cross, Blue Shield, Humana, um, all of them offer some form of um, health benefit, a fitness benefit, and because they can um, be a part of three of these different organizations, you have to sign on to contract all three of them. So, um, so that's why we, it's kind of cumbersome a little bit, but. Um, so Jean, uh, my question is, so it looks like there's starting to be some possible like overlap and with your experience with the YMCA um, are you seeing <clears throat> some of the folks that is are as we expand fitness at the senior center are we now then competing with the Y for some of the same people or um, I think it's a complementary because <clears throat> of the fact that we needed to be competitive with them um, we were losing participants because of their health insurances. So if we didn't sign on to these contracted services, then they would have gone and they would stay there. So for us to provide and give options to individuals, then we also had to be a part of these um, insurance reimbursement programs too. So I say that um, in my eyes, it's, it's a complimentary thing because we tell the individuals, you know, the best thing for you is if you want to come and work out at the senior center, but also go to the Y and use their swimming pool or go to if you wanted to uh, take a class at another facility. I think if we all work together, it's a complimentary thing. It's not, I don't look at, at it as a competition. Can you explain to, to the council how, the, how this works through the insurance program and so what this the citizen may pay for the program, but they get reimbursed, or how does that work? Uh, what it is is that if you are on a Medicare um, insurance plan that offers this fitness benefit, it is no charge to you. But through each contract, we get reimbursed per visit, and there's a maximum per visit that we would just get reimbursed for, but individuals can come and work out as many times as they want. So I'll give you an example. 
Um, we signed on with a company called American Specialty Health. The um, fitness reimbursement program is called Silver and Fit. It goes with insurances that have um, AA or, uh, Aetna, Blue Cross Blue Shield, and WPS, which is Wisconsin Physicians Services. And that reimbursement for us is a $3 visit up to 10 visits. So a max we could get per month is $30 per month from, from that insurance. So we submit their, their visits at the end of every month, and then we get a check back. So currently right now, through our silver sneakers, we will probably get about $20,000 at the end of the year reimbursed from that silver sneaker plan um, back into the center from the visits that the participants were participating in and one thing that the silver <coughs> sneaker program anyone that had united healthcare uh, united healthcare backed out of the silver sneaker program and then uh, signed on with a company called healthy contributions which is a optum fitness advantage so we would have lost approximately 50 individuals that were a part of silver sneakers that if we didn't sign on with the optum they would have probably left us and maybe worked out at another facility that had offered the optum fitness advantage which the ymca is another entity signed on also so and i think back to your um, your question Council Member Palmieri is um, Jean and her staff are having conversations with the YMCA on other collaborative opportunities. Um, Jean is also on Evergreen's board as the leadership adjunct board member, and she's already had some conversations with them on, on some possibilities, um, as well as talking with some of the local hospitals when um, individuals go in for a surgery or a procedure and they have limited physical therapy at the hospital um, to have them come to the senior center and maybe it's getting on our equipment and doing some physical therapy or walking on the river walk and using our facility so um, they've had those types of conversations for collaborations as well so how many yearly rate members do you have um currently right now we have about 869 we, we just got that number <laughs> uh, that are active in the Fox Fitness Center, in our fitness classes, and also in our wellness offerings. So we're looking to obviously increase. For example, um, the, there are 1,500 people in our area, because we had asked for our zip code area, who uh, could be eligible for the Silver and Fit program. And that will start up in, on December 1st. Um, currently with the Optum, we have about 590 additional people that have the O2 zip code that could be eligible for the Optum. So we get um, stats from these companies to let us know in our, in our area what, who could be eligible to join us in these programs. They also are eligible to go to other entities too. So like I said, if um, they sign up through us and sign up through the Y. It's actually a benefit for everybody, and it's a benefit for so our insurance can companies. Use this, um, or any of these silver sneakers under that Medicare umbrella, they can have multiple memberships and use correct. their pass. Correct. Correct. Okay. It's only that it's not an either or. whatever entity they get one visit per day, wherever they go. So. So in order, again, in order for us to continue moving towards um, a few things with the fitness program is going with a one fee. It eliminates um, many things that are occurring now at the North facility. It's very hard for staff and individuals to really realize when you walk in the door who's going to classes and who's just going to the Fox Fitness Center. It's, it's not really an ideal setup as well as our future what does it look like when we go, if we um, open up the building at nighttime or on weekends? It allows us to just let them scan in and go and do whatever they want to do. And then if we offer classes or a wellness workshop or a seminar, we're not worrying about, okay, did you attend, you know, with the, with the old uh, structure, it became very cumbersome for our, for our staff. 
Just out of curiosity, can you remind me, does the senior center offer any kind of shuttle transportation or is that is that not part of our programming? Uh, the GO Transit comes right to our facility, drops no, off I mean, individuals. Got, we don't have any we don't, no, shuttle. No, no. Uh, they can use Dial-A-Ride. There's a lot of right. transportation things in the community that they can use. But some of like, is it Evergreen or Bella Vista, they do some of that? Mm -hmm. That's correct. Does. Right. We, do, we do work with uh, GO Transit for individuals that come to the senior center. We do um, reimburse GO mm -hmm. Transit for those bus rides. Oh. So that is part of the senior center budget. Um, I'm going to keep going, but one other item, if you take a look at the fee, the proposed fees for 2018 and look on the opposite side of the fitness information, you're going to see some of the program and just drop in fees. Um, you're going to see that we are proposing going up slightly in some of those areas. Um, one of the main reasons is, if you recall, the Department of Revenue came in recently and um, looked at all city departments. Um, there were some areas at the senior center where we were not properly um, paying taxes. Um, so the fees haven't been increased in a while, plus we're looking at um, now including the taxes included in that fee to help with that issue. So we wanted to make sure you're aware of that too. And I made a note here, I need to make sure that the council is aware that the Friends of the Senior Center continues to be a strong supporter of the Senior Center. Um, their food truck Fridays were very successful this year. They're looking at um, at least three of them again next year. Um, but I believe this year, Gene, correct me if I'm wrong, they are contributing $50,000 towards the operation. And um, Gene has submitted a proposal next year um, to take that up just slightly to $51,300. Um, so they are definitely um, been very active. Um, I think they've upped their, their game in their fundraising and Jean and her staff have worked very closely with them to make sure that they are successful. So um, I wanted to make sure that you're aware of that. Is that included in the revenue miscellaneous? Is that where that reflects or is that? That's gonna be actually in the 231 budget. There's two separate budgets for the senior center. So we're on the 201 and my guess is the 231 is gonna be the next couple pages. 231 is the general yes. operations. So if you take a look at page 189, the mm -hmm. 231 account, that is the, the general operations or where the, the general fund supports the operations of the senior center. So okay. if you look there, um, where is it going to be? Yeah, it's It'll under the, the miscellaneous answer. revenue. Oh, miscellaneous. Right. It's lumped in with asking. it. Yes, it is. It, it is yes. in the miscellaneous. Yes. Okay, so about 50000 of that, you say? Of that um, uh, this next year, 2018, we're looking at 51.3. In 2017, it was five, uh, 50000 And the levy went up to support the senior center, too, correct? A little bit? Yes, and this year. the big year. bump was last year when it went up because of the loss of the uh, Fox Valley tax. That is okay. a, and a more modest Social, this year. Lutheran Social Services also last year. Yeah, so. both of them. Yes. You guys maybe want to discuss at all the potential of a name change with the council? Or? Yes, that is, um, that's one that's been discussed on and off for a number of years. Um, it is still on our radar um, with other things going on. We have Walter hired to do our strategic plan for our entire parks department, which the senior center is part of. Um, we have him under contract, and we're looking to start that yet this fall. Um, and part of that, we'll be having that discussion with um, the senior center, the, um, the friends, as well as the senior center board. Committee on Aging will probably have a little discussion as well. So it's Walter Jankowski. Walter Jankowski, yes, I'm sorry. Is there, is there been any discussion at all of maybe <laughs> one or two nights a week of being open later? Um, with Jean starting this year, she had a long list of items that I had on her goal list. Right. Um, her goal for next year is to be evaluating um, because we are expanding the fitness. Um, right. So we're looking at the, the younger working seniors, possibly having some evenings or weekend hours. Um, so that'll be one of her goals next year is coming up with how are we going to staff that, how are we going to operate that. Um, so short term, that's going to be something she's going to be working yeah, on as I part think of her I, goals. You know, talking to the younger seniors, mm -hmm. if you want to call them that. Um, <clears throat> being more active and maybe even working longer, they may come to some functions or events at mm -hmm. the senior center if the hours were until say eight o'clock or something. Because I think, I think right now it's difficult for that active working senior to get and use the facility because mm -hmm. of you know, the working. Yeah, I've had a lot of, lot of requests from people, so as Councilman mm -hmm. Rapel, yes. about yep. you know, we work until five, but you close at 4.30 and we'd like to take advantage of some of the facility. 
Right, and we needed to get to that one fee. And as you can see, the proposed 2018, um, we needed to get to that one fee so that when we advertise and market to those people, we can say, it's only $17 for you to come and use the facility. Yeah. It's too, like I said, it's too cumbersome to go and say, um, a, a pick and choose mm -hmm. type well, structure. Speaking of pick and choose, and this is going to muddy the mm -hmm. water a little more, but there's also been some requests, and yeah, I'm kind of curious about it. I think um, other um, senior centers are doing this that um, there may be the opportunity to have a uh, multi generational packet membership where you may have, you know, anything from a grandchild to a great-grandchild depending upon that family makeup and having a certain number of I guess maybe not necessarily programming specific to that but that opportunity for intergenerational learning well I think that can be just done through the programming but if it's like if they come in and just use the facility then I do believe it kind of takes away from our mission which is for individuals that are 50 and above well is no that, with that individual, not by themselves. So, mm -hmm. in other words, you know, grandma, and grandpa, bring grandma, grandpa. Kids with them. Yeah, exactly. Well, I, I know. know you guys have like an occasional event where it's open, right? Like that, but that's just been some further requests in the community for that mm -hmm. as an option. Well, I've been to some. I'm on the board of Evergreen Village, and I've been to some leading age conferences. And the the issue comes up: there's a lot of grandparents that don't have their grandchildren nearby. And there's a lot of children that don't have grandparents nearby. So there's programs in different cities, one of which I think is called Buddies, where the older people adopt a younger younger person, and they have a, have an opportunity to really learn about each other because the grandparents they may see them once a year. So mm -hmm. that type of, those type of programs where it's they're helping each other to kind of learn about the whole different right. generational right. thing. And I've heard comments from a woman who was the superintendent of schools, I think, in Cleveland. She said. In many communities, don't forget grandparents are only in their 40s. <coughs> They're not the grandparents we, most of us, grew up with that, you know, grandmas had that purple blue hair, which mm -hmm. they don't do anymore. Um, so I think that's something we should look at for the future is. Uh, to look at more options in the generational programming. Mm -hmm. and generational and filling that, filling that gap where the kids don't really see grandparents that often and vice versa. I think mm -hmm. it would be very healthy. I know we did, um, well, they've been doing it with the, the North High School with some of the technology right. programs, and I agree that maybe the, the grandparent and the adopting of a, a grandchild sounds neat. Um, earlier this year, we did do a, a program with the Senior Center and the special ed programs through the school district where we had a um, fishing event down at the Senior Center. Um, that typically was held at Menominee Park, and it was in the spring when you didn't know what type of weather you were going to get. So we had some discussions with the school district staff, and because we have the um, indoor facility at the Senior Center, everything was held there. We had the fishing pier. We worked with um, Sweetwater Marine as well as the boat club. They were, the kids were getting boat rides, um, as well as Otter Street Fishing Club provided um, fishing poles for each one of the kids. Um, we got the bait donated. We got meals donated. So I think a lot of those... That could be a start of some things. Um, we've had some discussion with other um, special needs parents. Um, Council Member Palmieri brought up the wood shop earlier about maybe bringing um, younger people in to learn the trade of wood shop. Um, we had some special needs parents saying maybe not the, the machines, but just hand tools and learning how to use hand tools with, with children with special needs. So I think there's a number of ways we can look at that. They want to work with Boys and Girls Club too. Mm -hmm. Sure. But back to Councilmember Herman, that is something that we will be looking at, especially um, now that Jean's got her, her feet on the ground and, and getting some of those things organized there. Because it does come with a cost. There's staffing costs. There's sure. overhead costs that need to be looked at as well. So, mm -hmm. Is there a specific... Uh, one person who called in particular asked whether or not there was a, a specific uh, wood shop fee but it looks like to me based on this the proposal is that would fall under the creative expression um, membership which allows you access to e is this an either or or all art studio computer yeah, lab which right what what came out of this the tax audit was we had a lot of things that were included in these um, fees <sighs> that actually fell into non-taxed categories 
So what we did was we condensed and found out what items should be taxed and we attached them to what needed to be um, a fee and a taxable fee. Some of the wood shop items fell under uh, a non-taxable program, which we will be doing that and putting those more into the January newsletter and into more of our programming part of it. So what we did was we just found what would be a taxable whenever you uh, were considered a recreation center and when you uh, charge for people to come in, it becomes a taxable item. So we're trying with this structure to work with um, what's tax and what's not taxable items. So, But as far as the wood shop, the drop-in type program, or if they want to come in and just simply use the shop, that is that Ed. that drop-in rate of 125 or 150 it is. But then but if they're- But classes are in a different category. Correct. Correct. If okay. they're going to be doing a class and producing a product, sure. then it will be under a program. I see. And what Jean and her staff will do probably through their programming account is figure out, all right, we have a staff member we have to pay. Here's the material cost. So is that the same, is the same true then with, say, knitting, you know, that you could do drop-in, I don't know. Knitting, you can do drop-in, but the minute that you attach um, supplies or an instructor, then it falls under the non-tax gotcha. category. Okay. So. So we've been. A lot of bean counting. <laughs> yes. Um, it was and, a learning experience for all. <laughs> and the fees are the same. If you live in the city of Oshkosh or outside the city, no, of Oshkosh. no, no. They have no. Different and I'm glad you brought that up because, um, oh, okay, there wasn't really a consistency to charging a non-resident rate. Um, what we found when Gene looked at the fee structure was most of the programs were the non-residents were paying one and a half times. So we pretty much said anything non-resident at this point, we're going to be charging one and a half times the resident rate. That really covers both of the senior center accounts. Um, so unless there's other questions, we can move forward. Um, so that would bring us to page 194 for the Riverside Cemetery. I'm going to let Bill take this one over. The cemetery is um, it's like forestry is a very limited account, very straightforward. Um, uh, there were a couple of items that Bill wanted to touch on as far as significant accomplishments and things that he'll be working on, though. Okay, thank you, Ray. Um, this year was uh, pretty exciting out at the cemetery, believe it or not, but uh, <laughs> we've uh, decided that we need to um, do a little more active marketing uh, and because a lot of people who come in didn't even realize that we still sell spaces and we still do burials and that sort of thing. So. We, uh, we partnered with Ann, and uh, she helped us create a social media presence. And then we also put together a marketing plan to go forward um, so that we can, uh, you know, start creating more awareness within the community about, you know, the resource that we have there at Riverside Cemetery, and then also emphasize some of the historic character of the property because it is on the National Registry of Historic Places, and, uh, and we... Uh, we have historic buildings there, a lot of historic monuments and that, that sort of thing there. So um, with that, um, Donna Brodsky, who is our office manager there, um, decided to reinvent the historic cemetery tour. So uh, we've had uh, several different tours uh, this uh, last spring and this fall, and uh, we intend to continue with that program into next year. So. Um, we've had pretty good attendance. Um, the, the tours have been well received and, uh, and it, all, it creates a kind of a, a opportunity for folks to actually come into the property to get to know it a little better and, uh, and that also what we offer as far as services out there as well. And is that person from the museum? Uh, no, um, Jenny Gross used to do okay. it years ago, okay. um, and so um, Donna Brodsky is actually our staff member oh, at the okay. at the cemetery. She's a half-time uh, clerk there, so she handles all the calls coming in, and then um, also has done a lot of research about the property too. So um, we're pretty excited about that. So uh, you know, you'll you'll see uh, Facebook posts and things like that regarding upcoming cemetery tours and that, that sort of thing. So I'd encourage you to attend if, if you get the opportunity. Um, I think at some point Donna may visit the council too to kind of uh, 
give you a little background on the tour too when um, I think I took a tour when Jenny was doing it like way back yeah she Wonderful. discontinued those a number of years ago so um, uh, we're trying to kind of you know change it up a little bit and, and keep it interesting and uh, and that's that as well so um, then also we uh, we've made some record keeping upgrades um, as you'll see in um, a number of years ago, we put in the cemetery information management system, which uh, basically replaced our DOS operating uh, <laughs> system out there. So um, we've actually got everything into a, a, a better digital uh, uh, management system now, so that all of our records and mapping is is uh, is more fluid. Um, so as you'll see in one of the requests, is we're we're actually hoping to upgrade that so that it, uh, to an eSIMS program, which uh, allows uh, better uh, smartphone capabilities. Uh, so we could actually take photographs of a headstone; it'll bring us to a map. Um, so it, it's uh, you know there's been some improvements in that software. So um, we're hoping to add on uh, the eSIMS program too, which will help us and eventually be able to get out um, uh, to the internet more so that people can do some of their own research. We tend to do a lot of genealogical research at, at our office uh, for folks as they come in, but we're, we're trying to uh, make this more available through Find a Grave and that sort of thing too. So uh, the eSIMS program will help us quite a bit. Um, we also had um, a, a very generous donation um, that came in this year from the Johnny Kinzel Foundation that allowed us to uh, do some repairs on the interior of the chapel. Um, the uh, over the years, uh, you know, just some moisture and humidity had caused some plaster um, to uh, crack and, and decay a little bit. And then also, it hadn't been painted for we don't know for how long. But um, but the uh, through the donation, we were able to bring in lab restoration and uh, re uh, fixed up all the plaster work. Uh, and uh, repainted the entire interior. So um, invite you all to get out there sometime and take a look at that. Um, it's, uh, it turned out really beautiful. So um, we also include the chapel as part of our historic cemetery tours as well. So um, we've done a lot of work over that building over in my tenure here. We've replaced the, the roof, uh, um, you know, and uh, both the flat roof and the tile roof and done uh, quite a bit of tuck pointing on the masonry part of the structure. So, uh, you know, we're in pretty good repair out there. There's always a few little minor things that we could do, but we're our, our hope is to um, better utilize that facility because it's, you know, essentially been, you know, un underused for, you know, quite a long time. So we feel that with some of the restoration that we can open it up for meetings or other uh, so events. It can be rented. Right. Yes, so um, so we we want to make it you know available to folks, and uh, we were a little hesitant to do that when the plaster and paint was in poor repair. So um, so more on that as as we proceed. Entertain any other questions? If anybody has any on that, I guess. I, I, oh, oh, sorry. One thing is we've all gotten an email from couple people concerned about dogs in the cemetery mm -hmm. um, is there much we can do I know it's posted that they're not allowed in the cemetery but it is posted um, yeah it, it is posted at the entry points um, our our uh, foreman out there is has also worked with the sign department they're creating some larger signs that we're going to put out there um, okay. the ones we have now are fairly small it, it's been on our signs for years but um, I think a lot of the issue is, you know, people want to get to the Wyawash Trail, and if they're coming from the neighborhood, it's easiest just to walk through the cemetery, obviously. Um, we approach people when we see them and let them know. Um, I know when I come into work in the morning at 6 o'clock, you know, I see people coming from across the street through the cemetery with dogs occasionally. Um, you know, so, you know, it, um, you know, it, hasn't really we haven't really seen a lot of you know like waste issues or anything like that out there but you know we we 
you know, explain to folks that they need to be respectful of the property and, and that sort of thing. And it isn't one of those properties that we allow <coughs> dogs on within the ordinance. Right. So, oh, like the trails. It, they're not even allowed just on the trails there, right? Uh, well, they can go on the Wiwash Trail with dogs. I mean, I the, not the streets. In, in the, yeah, the little street trails in between. No, there's a specific right. city ordinance prohibiting that. Right. Right. members complain they don't live out there. But we're, we're hoping to, you know, with the new signage, hopefully get their attention. Because something. a lot of times we'll, we'll talk to somebody who's standing right in front of the sign, and they say, well, we didn't see a sign. You know, so you know, there's some educational right. aspect to it as well. Okay. But it's always easy just to claim oblivion. Well, know, right. Be oblivious right. about it. So, but get so, away with it a couple times. Just so I understand, um, the perimeter. Okay, so going northwest from um, the cemetery, where where is the boundary? When it, I think there's a yield goat as a retail establishment um, on the extreme end but where right. where's our dividing line and what's what's happening with that kind of property in between the Wyowish, uh trail and Algoma and that retail building okay at the retail building is uh, just north of our property boundary there's uh, we we maintain the gravel road that goes um, okay you know and that's actually you can connect to the Wyowash trail right okay. there too um, that area from the you know the northernmost point of the burials up to the yield goat um, you know is essentially future expansion area future for expansion. the cemetery okay. currently we use it for storage of materials uh, you know spoils from excavation uh, we we dump our wood there our chips and that sort of thing and um, use it as kind of a work area we have a, a municipal nursery up there so we utilize the property pretty extensively up there but it ultimately is expansion for future but uh, there is, you know, access to the trail from that gravel road as well, so you can skip onto the wire wash from that point too. Do we pay to maintain that? I don't know. Um, uh, was it swale or ditch between there, or is that a county thing uh, uh, with the between the wire wash and the cemetery? That. Um, that is, I believe, um, the railroad right of way, which Wyawash is, is essentially county managed at this point. Um, we also have um, American Transmission Company has right of way easement through there too. So, uh, in fact, they're working on it uh, or will be working on it shortly. They do um, some brush control through that ditched area. Um, the Wyawash is well. Does. ATC does, yeah. Um, <laughs> because they can't. They can't have anything that could potentially, you know, right. get into the. <coughs> so we don't session. have an expense of maintaining that area. That's somebody else's. No, we just basically mow up to the ditch, um, you know. So you know, between the county's efforts and uh, you know the utility um, companies, they maintain the balance of it at this point. <coughs> Okay, For so two now. we're on page 199. We'll begin with the <coughs> park revenue facilities. Okay, this one I'm going to have Jenny joining me because this is a number of um, areas where Jenny is involved. Um, Parks revenue facility really covers a multitude of areas. Um, to give you an idea, we are looking at the zoo, boat launch, the amusement rides area, concessions, um, any vending areas, the Miller's Bay, uh, the mooring plugs and so forth, uh, the REITs concessions, um, Jenny's special events, and then the Lake Fly Cafe. So the, all of those various areas are, are lumped into this budget. Um, what I wanted to do is just go through, just real quickly, if you take a look at page 199, under the 2018 proposed, you're going to see the grants and aids, $20,300. That is, um, again, some of that DNR grant funding that we're looking to utilize. Um, back to Mr. Herman's question, that is the, um, the DNR grant funding that will help pay for some of the electronic pay stations we're hoping to put into some of the boat launch areas next year. And then we'll be also utilizing some of the, the boat launch fund for that. Um, and I can show you where that is um, shortly. Um, 
A couple of items you're going to see here, again, back to some of our earlier discussions, if you look at the 6103 in this area, you're going to see that we did overspend considerably in this area. Um, a reason for that is um, the number of special events that Jenny is now hosting, whether it's at amusements or other areas throughout her facilities. Um, we needed to hire more staff. Um, the volunteers, we do as much as we can with the volunteers, um, but we do need a designated staff on site as well. So you're going to see that um, we did overspend there, and uh, we anticipate overspending there again this year just based on uh, the number of special events that Jenny has been pulling in. Um, She'll talk a little bit more about some of those, but as you're well aware, what we try to do is offer events that are either um, fully supported, sponsored, or low cost of the participants to come into. And I think that's really been our goal, um, not only in this area, but in the leech when we get into that. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit later, but um, I don't have the entire numbers here, but Jenny probably does, but I believe she was able to generate about $30,000 this year in sponsorships to make all of her programs either sponsor supported um, or very close to that. So um, she does a lot of work soliciting um, donations and uh, whether that's monetary or product and she can talk about some of those. Um, if you take a look at page 204, these are some of the um, <coughs> what we put in as enhancements for some of these areas. Um, there's an, uh, a pretty good fund balance that's been carried over from all of these various areas. Mm -hmm. And what we're looking to do is utilize some of that um, fund balance this year. I'll touch on uh, that page 204 if you look. The zoo exhibit, we had hoped to have that project um, fundraised and completed this year. Um, we're working with the Community Foundation as well as some other um, donors to um, try to raise $75,000. The entire project is 150. Um, in this year's um, zoo budget, um, we were intending to use $75,000, again with the 75 in donation match. Um, I believe we have approximately 25,000 of that committed, so we're probably about $50,000 short at this point. Um, Carlene and I, Carlene from the foundation and I have been um, getting the word out to um, donors that we would like to get this project funded and hopefully constructed next year. So that project remains in our plans. Um, going down the list, you'll see there's a, um, we're looking to um, get a walk-in freezer fridge type um, facility down at our zoo maintenance building. Um, we need to have that for the diet for some of the animals, mainly the wolves and the meat and uh, the things we need for the otter feed. Um, we need some additional storage space for the, um, the food. Um, the boat launch kiosk, we, we replaced some of those this year. Those are our informational kiosks that are located near the pay stations. Um, we're looking to do a couple more of those. Um, electronic pay stations, um, these would be um, new for us and we're looking to possibly do three of them next year at some of the boat launches. Um, what people would be able to do is pay with debit card, credit card, cash, um, a little bit easier customer service. Um, it would help us as far as handling money and cash potentially. Um, we've checked with a couple other communities that have gone to the electronic pay stations and they've seen their revenue go up considerably. Um, one, I believe, was um, down in Monona. They saw their boat launch revenue go up about $10,000 um, in the first summer of using the electronic pay station. So um, talked about this at the Parks Board, and we decided to um, give it a try at a couple of them next year and see how it works out. And if it um, is successful, then we'd look at expanding that. So um, those would be coming, um, a portion of that would be coming out of the boat launch fund in addition to some of the grant funding. At the Lake Fly Cafe, um, we're looking to replace the serving windows. As you can imagine, there's plenty of bugs down there, and the concession windows are just a roll up and down window. Um, we're looking to have screened in windows with just sliding doors so that there's less lake flies and, and other bugs coming in by our staff and into and the windows. You have to change the name. Yeah. <laughs> it's really the birds. <laughs> <laughs> So that's what that improvement is. And then at the, um, again, at the zoo maintenance building and not the zoo mountain building, I see there's a misprint there. Um, there's some um, remodeling we need to do for the restroom facility in there, as well as um, we do have some animals that we keep in there for the year and we need to improve their exhibits for them to uh, remain in that facility. So Chad is continuing to work on that. Um, I'm gonna let Jenny briefly go over some of the, um, some of the accomplishments that we got listed and then some of the, the objectives that'll be coming up. And if there's questions, she can help answer those. Thank you. Um, so we did have a, um, we had a good year um, under this budget. Like Ray mentioned, um, at the Amusement Center, we have a five events every year. Um, 
well, we actually I should take that back. We typically had three events. Chad wanted to see me add um, two more events, so we had one each month essentially, one from May till September. So that was one of my goals for 2017. So we added on a bubble day. Um, this summer and then we added on like an end of the year event which was like a children's day parade we did and then we had um pony rides that day and things too so both of those <laughs> events went great um we did get all of our <coughs> events this year over at the amusement center 100 percent sponsored so anything we did there was free for families to come with their kiddos and enjoy the day and they were all sponsored so um, our bubble days we had um, the university came over we did all different experiments with the kids they had big <coughs> pools of bubbles to play with we had wands where they could blow bubbles everywhere we had bubble machines and games and crafts um, partnered with the girl scouts as well so they could do some bubble prints and just fun things that kids love we um, like Ray mentioned as all the events kind of get bigger and bigger and people kind of find out about them that they're free we really have to put more staff on just because they get really crazy and hard to manage without having um, staff there so um, the end of the year event that we had this year too is great um, all the kiddos they would build their little floats whether it's a wagon or a bike or whatever they did um, some really cute little ideas and we had little you know medals and trophies and things and we had punch and cookies um, and pony rides so it was a great it was on that weekend though it was like 95 degrees in September mm -hmm. so it was interesting but it was good um, so definitely things that we'll do again it was a lot of fun um, we did purchase um, three new they call them sup boards they're the stand-up paddle boards um, we talk it every year we need to get our water equipment out there more it's highly used as far as aqua bikes and paddle boats because people see them from the road driving by but i can't tell you how many times a day my phone rings and says oh you rent kayaks and ki you know canoes they have no idea so those things that aren't as visible from people driving by and seeing the big huge wheels uh, we still work on really getting those out there and that's the same with those those paddle boards you can't see them from the road so people you know we're getting the word out there that we actually have them um, so we work on that and again, you know, working with marketing and just letting people know what we have and what they can rent and how they can rent them type thing. So, um, and Ray kind of always touched on the, the boat launch stuff, um, always improving those and the kiosk and trying to make them look you know, nice and for people paying that boat launch fee. So, and um, did you have like a monster bash grown up event? Here that's this through fall? the society. Yep. And that actually, um, as far as um, events in the zoo went this year, we um, had Zuluween a couple weeks ago. We had a record-breaking year in 15 years on Saturday. We saw um, 2,746 people in one day in four hours. It was crazy. It was wonderful, um, but again, just you know, trying to get that many people through and having enough staff to do it. And um, so it was a beautiful day. It was like 72 degrees, so it was wonderful. The reason I'm asking is mm -hmm. um, I, I was just curious whether or not the zoo in and of itself is a like a venue that organizations can rent out for fundraisers i think i've seen things like jazz at the zoo and you know these kinds of things in other cities and i'm just curious whether or not that's <coughs> something that we do or are looking at doing sure the society did that one um they had a really great turnout too um you know unofficially i believe they said they had about 175 people that were there that <coughs> night um it was a beautiful night i left there about 7 30 that night um after the daytime stuff and they had a great crowd so the society is stepping up and doing more and more and getting more involved um they, you know, they want to. They did a wolf event, um, you know, in the past, and they've done some a daughter event. They've done some different things, so they're stepping up and doing more and more um, as well. So. so the Zoo Society has what relationship to our funding? They support the zoo. Um, they fundraise. So they're like a friends of. Uh, right. right. Okay. What, what they do is um, there's a zoo education coordinator position that was new this year, and they have, um, they're going to fund that next year, I believe, to the tune of about $9,000. Ten thousand. Nine thousand. Nine thousand. So basically. they are they're supporting a part time position for education. Um, they'll they have contributor committed towards um, helping fund the eagle exhibit. Okay. Um, they do educational signage for us. So they're they work more on the educational and promotion side in a fundraiser. Okay. Um, back to your question about possibly having other events down at the zoo. It's a little difficult having the animals and uh, dealing with the security. Um, I think 
knowing that it's the zoo society, we know we can work closely with them. Right. But if there's an interest in some type of event, I'm sure between staff and the zoo society, it's something we'd be willing to sit down and say, maybe we could do something jointly. Um, but as far as saying, yeah, you can rent it for a wedding or something like that, it really gets a little difficult. So Yeah, I was just thinking along the lines more of like kind of what you're doing now that's more family friendly. But I mean, sometimes the adults want, you know, just some adult event to go to that's, mm -hmm. you know, another change of scenery. I, again, I didn't know if that was something that you guys were looking at or not. Sure. Well, we use the tent that you've set up for uh, the children's event. Yeah. So we felt we had to have a tent because it was... In October, we weren't sure the weather. The weather was perfect. It was, yeah. Jenny, when somebody sponsors an animal, is that through mm -hmm. the society or is that through you and society. goes society? That's the society. Mm -hmm. Yep. So it was a good year overall. Lots of, I mean, we have a lot of support for for our zoo and for amusement center and different things. So it's great to see. I didn't look at the numbers this year, but I know last year we were over 110,000 visitors through the gate. I don't know if you've looked at it. I don't those. quite have that done yet. So we'll, right. we'll be able to include that in our final budget document as far as some reports, but um, well over 100,000 people each year. And I go back to, I think it was 2006 when the Heronberg started with their donation. The attendance was right around $40,000. So it's gone up considerably um, over the last 10 years. Um, one item I did want to touch on here because it is listed is um, under the, our objectives determine the future of the carousel ride I know the public has been asking and some of the council members have gotten questions um, that ride is is very old um, we had to take it down because the, some of the major bearings on top are um, in disrepair um, preliminary cost estimates we're getting anywhere between a hundred to hundred fifty thousand dollars to repair that um, we're trying to work on some donors and some possible fundraisers but looking online we're able to find a um, an operable carousel for anywhere from sixty to one hundred thousand dollars. So some of those are some of the things we're going to have to start taking a look at. Um, do we replace it with a carousel? Do we look at something like a miniature golf outing or something? We're we're generating some ideas internally as well. Um, something that might be less maintenance, other than putting in another carousel. Even though um, we are hearing from people, we'd like to see it return, but it is a large chunk of money that um, we really don't have. So. Um, we're evaluating that, and uh, hopefully within the next year, um, we'll, we'll be able to figure out what's going on, so. The Henry Vilas did that with their carousel in Madison, and they have perfected getting money from people, and the society has talked about going down there and talking to their people. How have you raised this kind of money? Yeah. Is that a pavilion enclosed one? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, they're just gorgeous. And those are some of the, see the ones we're seeing online that have a canopy or something over it to keep the weather off it a little bit more. So, you know, do we go down the route of repairing what we have or look for something new to come in and still we'd have to come up with that additional fund, so. I think the only thing we want to notate just because I, I asked about it is the miscellaneous and that amount fluctuates <clears throat> due to the timing of the Herrenberg donation. Yes, um, and I can, I'll touch on that real quickly. If you take a look at um, 2015, for example, you'll see the miscellaneous revenue was at about $155,000. If you look back to 2014, not being on the sheet, it probably was low down at about 50000 maybe because um, what we do is the Herrenbergs and the foundation will get us that $65,000 when it's beneficial for them for tax purposes, whatever that may be, we may get it by the end of the year or we may get it within the first two months of the year. Um, if looking at this year, you'll see the um, 2017 year end, or I'm sorry, the appropriation, uh, the 163, um, that included the Herrenberg donation as well as our miscellaneous sponsorships, but also we were hoping for that $75,000 in funding and donations for the um, Eagle exhibit. Um, that has not come to fruition yet. We are hoping that by the end of the year it will, so we've included that in the year and estimate yet. But then you'll see next year it drops because we removed that 75000 that we're hoping we're raising. So that one will always fluctuate, like Trina said, based on timing. Okay. Well, how do you account the $9,000 or $8,000 that we pay for the <coughs> education coordinator? What are, how does that get recorded here? It, we have to run it through the city for yep, pay, that, but it's actually, we um, pay that, for it. Yeah, it's a donation coming from the society. We'll put that into the, the miscellaneous. And the individual that's hired is actually a city employee then. Right. But it's, um, so yes, it is accounted for the miscellaneous. That is correct.
There's no other questions. I think we can move on to the leech. Trina, you good? Yep. Okay. On page 205. Um, this is a, um, again, a fairly straightforward, um, I would say, stagnant budget for the most part. Um, I'm going to let Jenny talk about some of the events again because hopefully um, some of you were able to get down to the Tuesday nights, which this year was um, overwhelming uh, based on what our expectations were, and we hope to see that continue. Um, the one item, again, you'll see here is um, the 6103 for next year is going to be um, going up again um, because we're looking at um, not only possibly adding some additional events, but increasing the um, hourly salary for part-time seasonal individual. So I'll let Jenny talk a little bit about some of her events. Yeah, um, this one, you know, we had an excellent year down there. Um, the Tuesday Night Concert Series, we had over 4,000 people attend those six nights this year. That is sponsored by Verba Credit Union. They were extremely, extremely happy, so on board for next year already for a sponsorship for that event. Um, we brought in food trucks this year, which was great, um, a great addition. We had some really good bands down there. We had some really good weather down um, one night, bad storms. Um, but the other five, were, you know, we had really good weather. So really great to see between the bands, the marketing, the advertising, and the food trucks um, brought in some really, you know, really good crowd. So we're hoping to continue to build that, um, possibly try, um, you know, maybe a Friday night as well, having a, a band down there. So we were really, really excited about that. Um, love having that facility full of people, just having a good time. You see kind of earlier in the evening, you know, families will come down with their kiddos and get them some food and kind of enjoy the entertainment and then maybe they leave and then the next crowd comes down and gets some food and listens to the night music. So it's a really great, um, a great night down there for everybody. So um, in addition to that, we had four family movie nights down there. Um, we had a touch a truck event and we also had the kids from Wisconsin, which was kind of a unexpected thing. And all those also were fully covered. So, um, none of them costed, you know, this budget, any money. We were able to find sponsors for all those movies, um, kids from Wisconsin and touch a truck. So anything we made in concessions then, then becomes, um, you know, extra money for us, um, in the budget. Um, but there's no cost to the people coming to any of those events, um, between all the, the kids from Wisconsin, we you know definitely had good over 1,500 people. It was a great day, and people really liked them. Um, Touch a truck, we definitely had over 2,000 people, and the movies we saw over 1,500 people on those four movie nights. So, again, any way we can continue to just get those dates out there for people to to come and enjoy those free family events. So, but um, lots of good sponsors again in this account, so it didn't cost any any dollars out of the budget. I just want to bring the uh, to the attention of the council. You'll see the fund balance. Um, we're consistently hovering around that 33, 35. This is an area that Trina and Mark and I have talked about. That one of our goals, since um, we've taken over the the programming there, is to not continue to see that deficit grow. And I think Mark and Trina have been giving some thought to asking the council in the near future, maybe to uh, usually maybe use some cash to pay off that to get it zeroed out eventually. Um, but that'll be a discussion that we'll have in the future. But at least I wanted to point out, um, as Jenny said, we're trying to get as much sponsors so we're not consistently seeing that that dollar amount continue to go in the hole at this point. So that hole was dug quite a while ago, and it's it's maintained that that negative thirty five thousand. And uh, Trina and I were. Talking about that, anticipating the question. Kind of like the know. parking utility. <laughs> no, it's not like that exactly. because this is this was, you know, when PMI ran it before mm -hmm. 2009. Um, I think within the for my first couple of weeks of being here, PMI called and said we're not going to do this anymore, and that's where we we the, the first couple of years after PMI left, we went down into that hole, and then when Ray got here, we studied that ship, um, but that negative has been there for this entire decade and I think just to make it clean it's to identify some of these funds we've done that in the past not ones that have hundreds of thousands of dollars but one of these ones where I, I'll just call it a little hole and just to get it back on track uh, might be appropriate just to, to zero those out and then fresh start um, so we would put that under uh, one of our loss categories basically take the money from the general fund just zero it out and be done with it I know we're butting up to our time limit here so if there's no questions I'll keep going into the pool budget uh, which is on page 209 
Um, this year was obviously not the best summer for swimming. Um, if we hit 90 degrees once, I think we were lucky. Um, so you're going to see that in the um, the fees and charges. Um, the revenue was down. Um, so you're going to see a, a not a, a good year at the pool. Luckily, we have a little bit of a fund balance going here, so we can absorb that and hope for a better summer next year. Um, your um, one item I wanted to point out that if the council recalls earlier this spring, I let you know that the recreation department, because we contract with them for the guards, they were um, having trouble getting enough lifeguards. Um, what we ultimately ended up doing them was told them to increase their hourly salaries by about a dollar an hour. Um, they did that. They were able to get enough staff. Um, and that is under line number line item 6446. It's called contractual employment. So you're going to see that um, we budgeted um, 126, um, figuring we may have to have a little bit of room in there, knowing that the economy was getting better. It still came in under budget, but um, we are going to plan that they're going to you know, continue to possibly increase their lifeguard rates as well. Um, and similarly, looking at our 6103, we're expecting we're going to have to increase our seasonal rates because this is one area we struggle to get people to operate our concessions and our admissions. Um, so we're looking at uh, that increase here as well. Um, otherwise, it's a, a pretty, pretty consistent budget. Um, we are looking at, um, if you look at page 212, machinery and equipment, we're looking to replace some of the deck chairs. We have not done that in a number of years. Um, so we're looking to replace, um, looks like 50 deck chairs out there to um, help with making sure people have somewhere to sit when they come. Um, any updates, Jenny, on anything? No, just like as Ray said, I mean, I'm, I'm at least we got what we got for the summer. It was extremely low. I mean, really cool days, really cool nights, um, quite low attendance. So that's, I mean, some summers are like that, I guess. So, um, but other than that, um, we did have some good special events. Our special event sponsor over there is Winnebago Community Credit Union. So we do six special events. They sponsor that one for $3,000 and they are back next year too. So they're excited. They like what we do over there. So they're on board for 2018. So um, that's exciting. And we're going to kind of, um, they asked if they could kind of help do some new logos next year just to kind of change some things up. They have an intern coming in. So we said, yeah, absolutely. We'll work with them. So they're excited for next year. and. And we hope for better weather next year. So other than that, um, it was, you know, it was a good summer besides the weather. So. Okay. I, guess I just had one last follow-up question and that was kind of going back to um, citizen request for um, apparently they're, they're planning to come to the parks advisory board going back to skateboard park. Um, where is that in our, is that in our general parks? Skateboard park, yes, would be yeah. in the and general was, parks. Wasn't that like fundraised by a private group, if I recall, or maybe I'm thinking of something else? Um, there was um, contribution from the foundation. There might have been a small fundraising effort. You might be thinking that a couple of years ago, actually just after I started, the BMX bike group That's was trying to raise some money, and that um, just fell by the wayside. Yeah, they spent all their money out at the... Out at the county. Expo Center on that. That I, I mean, it's BMX racing, but that track has got blacktop in some areas. It's got, they've spent a lot of money mm -hmm. working on that project. So. But that being said, though, to the skateboard park, or, uh, we haven't, do we have any maintenance issues or things? I didn't see anything in our budget this year. I know last, was it last year or year before we spent some money on the, Improving the skate park, right? We did. We had um, some concrete work. Um, I'd have, to, I believe, we have something in our CIP. I'd have to check with Chad. He has that on his list, um, and I, I unfortunately I don't have that here. But we do have some maintenance items there. The biggest thing we find there sometimes is the vandalism, um, some right. spray painting. Um, when there's bikes in there with the, you know, the metal components that then chip the concrete, um, that's why the bikes were not allowed. Same oh, thing, you know, the same reason with the scooters. Sometimes with the scooters as well, okay. um, the metal pieces will chip off the concrete, which then cause concerns for the skateboarders and us for okay. maintenance. That gotcha. being said, that's on the west side of Oshkosh, along with our disc golf. Is there any discussion of maybe a second one somewhere with the growth of the city or? incorporating one of our existing parks and a new another skateboard area there's that? not but as part of the corp update which we're going through we could possibly look at one of those I'm just thinking you know that again having free entertainment there are things for kids to do that's somewhat safe 
mm -hmm. would be a nice opportunity. Yep, we can make a note of that and maybe put it in at um, one of the West Side parks or one that might be developed in the future. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good. Yes. Thank, thank you. you. Um, my our final one is golf. So we've got both Trace and Scott here. Um, <coughs> this is one I did um, hand out. There are some proposed golf course fee increases next year. Um, you can take a look at those and I can maybe have um, Trace walk through the, the ones that we're looking at. Any increases are the obviously the bolded ones under the proposed rates. Uh, the back side of the uh, sheet will give you the anticipated additional revenue from each of those areas um, with a total expected increase in revenue of about $11,600. Um, a number of those haven't been increased in a few years. Um, Trace also takes a look at other um, golf courses in the area to um, look at what they're charging and uh, as far as the the season itself um, as you're aware Scott um, took over the um, supervisor role when Steve Dobish retired back in May um, he helped kept, keep the golf course going and um, I know I've gotten a lot of comments and hopefully the the council members that have been out there I've heard from league players that I play in that the course was in good shape so I wanted to make sure Scott was aware of that and um, and all the work that Trace does um, I don't know if there's anything you guys want to highlight. I know Trace has a couple items as far as some of the increases that you did. Sure. Um, just go over the golf course. It's been a, just your average year out there, as you can imagine. A <laughs> mm -hmm. um, couple of things for this year. I was looking to increase league participation. I looked and started a Tuesday night league. My goal was 16 golfers to at least get it going. Um, I ended up capping it at 40 golfers. We had so much people wanting to play. It was basically a group of guys that wanted to play after work because most of the leagues start too early. So we did 5.30 shotgun. Um, going forward, no problem. We'll get that to 80 people in the future. Um, there's, it was that popular this year. A lot of people already wanted to sign up. Um, the other thing you know, we've always tried to increase out there is lessons, trying to get new people into the game. Um, last I looked, I think we're up about 25% in lessons this year. Started a junior program as well. Um, the rec department does run a junior program out there as well, but I started one up this year so we could just get more kids out there throughout the entire summer. And the fees, you know, the increases there that Ray mentioned earlier, the main ones are daily fees that haven't been touched. Um, anytime I look at fees at the golf course, I do look at all the golf courses in the area. We're never by any means the lowest. We're not the highest either. We kind of fall in the middle. That's always the goal. Um, not trying to undercut other businesses in the city. And just these fees just need to be touched up. They hadn't been touched in a couple years. Um, season passes went up this year, so that's why they all remained the same. And going forward next year, like I said, you know, the game plan is to increase that league as well as potentially add another league. And then um, sell the remaining of the whole sponsorships. That was a little challenging this year to sell whole sponsorships. Um, but we want to sponsor each hole. There's just extra money that comes in. Doesn't really, the only thing that costs us is just a little bit for the signage. So otherwise, I'll let Scott talk about what he did on the golf course. Oh, well, I, I've kind of got, gone through the budget here, and I, I need to do some maintenance on 10 more heads and six green more heads. Um, Fairway Moorheads haven't been done since I've been there. Uh, that's about six thousand dollars, and the Greens Moorheads is about three. And I, I don't see that in here at all. We did we, bump up. We um, did bump that up. up. In there, sixty-four twenty-six. You're going to see a jump in that light on it for some okay. of the the Moorheads uh -huh. there. So we did incorporate that. Okay. Um, and this next next year is the final year of the golf course or the golf cart rental agreement as well. Um, so we will have that to, um, to contend with or to, again, come back to the council and possibly selling those as we did a couple of years ago. What is the balance on that lease agreement? For the golf cart lease agreement? For the golf cart. What do we still owe? Well, we pay well, it's about... Year, it's yearly. Right. $23,000 a year. Yep, you'll see that under 6432. Right. That's essentially the lease payment. <coughs> 
Okay. Um, as far as the balance on the, the purchase to own, I don't have that in front of me. I'd have to get that through purchasing. They have a, the agreement on that. I mean, I, I guess what I'm asking is what would we owe if we did not go through the full lease? That I would need to get back to you on. Okay. Okay. And do we by chance have a calculation to like a cost dollar amount, I guess, if you will? Um, for the, I guess, stormwater mitigation that is per acre, um, that, that that piece of land serves. Do we have anything that kind of balances off of what of our, some of our other stormwater goals are? I would, I don't think we do at this point. Um, we did have the, um, we did apply for the the water credit, the storm water credit this year, which is going to be cutting our um, the storm sewer rate out there considerably. Um, and part of that study may have looked at some of that. I'd have to check with engineering and uh, Laura through our engineering helped me on some of that project. So let me make note of that question as well and try to get you that answer. Thanks. And right, <clears throat> same question I asked for the uh, senior center. Are the fees the same for resident and non-resident? That is correct. Unfortunately, at the golf course, we um, we don't even really track residency. We don't track um, like when you go to Fleet Farm, they ask for your uh, you know your zip code or whatever. We we ha don't have that. We have a simple cash register system at this point. So, um, going in the future, it'd be something we'd want to start tracking. It. Otherwise, it and, um, and one other thing I'd like to touch on is uh, uh, we need a new twenty horse uh, pump, which is thirty one hundred dollars. Including fittings, that we pump is we for the for the pump house, yeah, pump house. yeah, we lost that. And that's not in here. I think we did. I thought we put it in here as well, so we'll have to go back in and, and double check. Probably under minor equipment, I would imagine. That's normally where that kind of thing is. I agree. Got to double check though. Got a lot. Got a lot. Tw over twenty years out of that pump, so it's had a good life. We did discuss it when we met. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think we made those minor changes at the end. Okay. <clears throat> just wanted to make sure. And hopefully we can just keep the course running smooth, as smooth as it was this year. I do have to say, Trace and Scott have been nothing but pros through this all this uncertainty they've been going through. I want to publicly thank them in front of council. Mm -hmm. Sure. It's been stressful. <laughs> 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 yes, it is. That is the end of our budgets. Um, but before I ended, uh, you've heard a lot about the uh, the different ways we're doing marketing and the different fundraising and grant writing. Um, I want to make sure that um, the council understands with Ann, Ann Schaefer, who was a position that we funded um, 18 months ago between the Parks Senior Center and the Planning Division, um, has been working out great. Um, hopefully, Alan and his staff will tell you the same. Um, if you look through the budget, you'll see her. Um, accounted for in the different areas just to give an idea in the senior center budget she is um, about 0.53 FTE parks 0.27 and then planning is about 0 0.10 so essentially she's spending about a day helping planning staff a lot with the neighborhood association work um, and then uh, the rest of the time spent with parks when I say parks it's with the golf course senior center parks Jenny pool um, she's doing a great job and I think that we could um, use five more of her. We yes. could. Um, <laughs> solve our budget problems <laughs> if we had five more of her. Yeah, um, it's it's really been a good cooperation between the departments, and I think talking with the neighborhood associations, I think they would say the same thing. So I wanted to make sure that you're aware that she's bringing in a lot of dollars for the city. Yeah, these these shared um, positions are creative ways of approaching some of our more challenging issues when we can't quite staff fully in one area that sharing of that resource or that person is really helpful Good. that's it all right thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you. <coughs> moving on so we'll move on to our last budget of the year for uh the council workshops and that would be our museum budget um brad larson is here to present his budgets primarily uh, the mo the majority of his activity does happen in one fund but he does have a few supplemental funds 
um, as well. And so he starts on page 345, um, and this would be the museum membership fund. Again, this is one of his supplemental funds um, where you do see a, a small amount of transactions and revenue generation. I'd rather start with operating if it would be okay. Would you? The, let me just first, um, I've been watching the, uh, the workshops online, and I have to say I'm going to echo a lot of what you've heard from the other departments for a day and a half, and that there's really not a lot of change in my, my uh, budget uh, in the, except for uh, personnel-related. Museums had a really good year this year. Of course, top of the line is people of the waters. That really kind of tops everything because that's the number one part of our strategic plan. So we've had a really good year, and um, we're poised for a great year in 2018. We have a lot of things that are, are planned and are scheduled. Um, so page 355 is the, is the operating great. budget for the museum? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So in my budget, the, the main thing I want to point out is we have uh, two full-time positions, one part-time position, and three interns which are supported by either our trusts or our funds or private donations. So that totals $144,800. So we get a lot done uh, from those staff members or those staff positions that are funded through uh, not necessarily the tax levy but through alternate sources. So I want to point that out. That's really a, a, a big part of what we have been able to do over the, cup, over the last few years is because of those positions. Um, our one big thing we're going to do in, in 2018 is we're going to move to a different, a different uh, merchandise sales system. It's actually through the Munis system. And right now we have a hard time tracking our, our sales, our admissions. Ray mentioned that a lot of what they do at the golf course is all through a cash register system. And it's the same as at the museum. It's the same thing that would have happened, say, 30 years ago. So by moving to a new admission system, we're going to be able to track those people much clearer, the number of members, the number of kids, the number of adults, where they come from. It's going to be a really good change for us. And the other change is we're going to an online merchandise sales system. We've talked about this for a long time, and it's something we really need to do, and so we're going to make that move in 2018. We get so many people that are asking, can I buy this or can I buy that online? And right now they can't, and that's all lost sales for us. So that's going to be a big change for us, and I think it's going to be a very good change. And that actually is reflected um, not in the operating budget. We, we actually pay for that system through our membership budget. But the revenue that we generate would be reflected in, in the income in, in the operating budget. We're all really excited about that. With the online, is that something that your current staff can handle? Are you looking for additional help? No, to we, can all, we can handle that. And actually, when we were building People of the Waters, we actually <coughs> built in a storage room because we need to have a place to actually have the, the merchandise that we're going to sell in a ready position and all the material that we need for packing and shipping and all of that. So we thought about them when we were building People of the Waters and actually built that little mini facility into the exhibit. It's actually kind of in a back corner, false wall. So we can do that in-house, and we've, we had some conversations about that. So. Um, so that's a big move for us. And then I will mention that we have submitted a $28,000 grant, which is not reflected in my budget to the Wisconsin Department of Tourism. It's through their called Joint Effort Marketing Grant Definitely. for 2018. Um, so we won't know whether we actually were awarded that grant until into next year. So if we are aw awarded that grant, and I think we have a very good shot at, at getting it because of what we have scheduled next year, then the budget would have to be amended a little bit uh, to reflect that. But doesn't that GEM grant, I know there's multiple ones, but isn't there a component of that that requires like some new offering, a new mm -hmm. kind of medium? Yeah, and that's that's what this is. So uh, it's primarily for attracting 
an audience that's outside the region. Oh, okay. okay. So it would be, we would market primarily in southern Wisconsin, northern Illinois, the Twin Cities, and Iowa. And our last GEM grant was in 2014 for the Tiffany Window exhibition. But we have some good ex exhibitions coming up. Replay uh, is, a, is our big winter one. So I think combined with Replay and People of the Waters and some other things, I think we have a really good, uh, really good shot at it. So that's just a little overview of, of the budget. And um, so now I'll, if you have any questions on that, I'd be happy to answer them. The only adjustments that you probably would see in there are some things for insurance. There was a, a general adjustment of insurance um, for the year. I would just have a question about, um, so you've got a one full-time uh, graphic artist and then uh, your museum marketing membership coordinator. Mm -hmm. um, Sure, everybody is really busy, but I'm just curious, are there any opportunities there, um, let's say the, the senior center or the library um, needed some assistance? Do you, do you ever loan your people to the oh, other yes. departments? Quite often, actually. <laughs> uh, both, both those two positions have been loaned out to various departments. The library just got a graphic position of its own last, maybe it was this year, I can't recall, so not so much right, with the graphic. Right. Uh, person. It's easier actually to loan the expertise of the marketing person than it is the graphic person simply because we have so much graphic work in-house right? and we try to do as much in-house as we can as opposed to contracting it out sure. because it's cheaper than doing it. Um, the, graphic art, <coughs> the graphic artist updated the city's logo and worked on the walking signs too. He also worked on Oshkosh Media's logo as well. So there are no capital items for 2018 for the museum. Do you want to just maybe just give a high level overview of the other budgets? Um, there's minimal impact and, and no levy contributions, if I recall correctly. Correct. I'll start with the membership budget, uh, which is the first one that we mentioned before. I think it's two four, uh, 345. The membership budget is really strong, and we count on the membership budget um, for a many ways it's our membership is our core it's the people that support the museum not just through their membership but when we do fundraising activities the membership are really the folks that we court for contributions so if we looked at the membership budget from that point of view and as advocates the membership be, uh, assumes a much greater importance than just the dollars that you see here we use the membership budget for things like that e-tapestry project I talk, talked about, the online sales, that's a good example. They support exhibitions. They support, not in full, but in part, one of the full-time positions uh, that we have, the museum assistant curator position. So the membership is a very key component of, of the museum, and we're, we tap the membership fund very heavily this year and last year for People of the Waters. Our goal in 2018 is I guess the best way to put it is to rein back a little bit and build that fund back up. So uh, we've been very successful with that. Our membership is growing slowly, but it's growing. And uh, it's projects like, like the newsletter, which we get a tremendous feedback on, People of the Waters, all those things combined are what really contribute to the, to the growth of the membership fund. Uh, the next high level one is the exhibitions fund. Uh, the exhibition fund is at this point almost tapped out because of People of the Waters. Uh, plus we had to put the down payment for the replay exhibition. So our goal is to uh, rebuild that fund. However, looking long term, and this is something I'll want to talk with uh, uh, Ms. Larson about, is perhaps eliminating the exhibition fund and we will just use the membership fund as the vehicle. There's really no point in having those two funds. So we may, you may very well see that exhibition fund just go away for the 2019 budget. Brad, what is the replay that you 
replay <clears throat> it was put together by the same um, firm or the man that did the Lego exhibit uh, a couple of years ago and replay is a is focused on pop art pop culture and primarily trying to captivate our work on the nostalgia from the 1980s and a key part of our strategic plan was to try to capture a younger audience by focusing on nostalgia and pop culture is very hot right now so it's really uh, art on pop culture themes uh, that were popular in the 1980s but it also has an, a Lego component and at least one of those sculptures will have been done by Nathan Sawaya. So this is going to travel the United States and Oshkosh is the first place that it will uh, start so we're, we're hoping for good things and this is a big part of the uh, Wisconsin Department of Tourism grant and when they heard about it they were pretty excited that's why I think we have a good shot at getting the the marketing grant. And when will that be? That opens in February I can't think like 12th maybe and it'll run through the winter months and, and in, in um, early spring and that is a really good time for us uh, because people are always looking for something during during the winter months to do. That's potentially an opportunity for some of our other venues to put out a 80s band concert type thing and do a package with you, right? We all, well, we do have, we are working on package with um, Convention and Visitor Bureau, marketing packages, hotel packages. Uh, so we're really getting uh, tying replay to that. But I think People of the Waters is also going to tie to that because now there's two reasons to come. So we're actually combining the two ex exhibitions, replay and People of the Waters. Plus there's some, um, there's we're working on some discounts so I think it ought to be a pretty good package that we can put together so that's that fund collections fund um, collections fund is strong we're we this year we had an unexpected um, but a very good um, opportunity to acquire the Helen Farnsworth Mears and her family and that collection so we had that expenditure from the collections fund but that's what it's for the collections fund um, was created largely from um, well we had a couple of big bequests that were the core but we also when we remove something from collections which we call deaccession a museum for a uh, term um, if we can't place that item in another museum it's sold at public auction the money goes back into the collections fund and it's the collections fund that fund that funds the treatment or conservation of artifacts and the acquisition of things like that mirrors collection that we purchased at auction so we try to keep the collections fund about right at about six hundred thousand dollars which is what it is right now um, so that fund is strong and we don't really have any anticipated acquisitions this year and then the last one is the Duro Trust, which is the big one. The big one was created, um, it's a, about $3.4 million right now. And that's on page, let's see. My apologies, it, it appears the Duro uh, has been Duro left out. Yes. Well, I'll just talk high, high level about it. The Duro Fund is doing very well. Um, we use some of the Duro earnings for people of the waters. The Duro Fund funds one position, a full-time curatorial position. And then it also uh, funds the care of collections that are specific to the uh, love that Mr. Duro had, which was decorative arts. Um, however, in 2018, we're pretty much, again, following the same pattern that we did with membership is we're pulling pulling back we're, we're resting that fund so we can rebuild it and um, it, it's it's one of those funds that we want to make sure we're very careful with we don't want to over over exercise the use of that fund because it was such a tremendous gift and it's been doing such good things for the museum it's had a just an amazing impact in so many ways so we don't really have big plans with for Duro other than funding the one position. So that's the high level overview. Thank you. That's all we have in terms of the departmental uh, 
presentations. We have the uh, budget hearing uh, scheduled for the first meeting, first regular meeting in November, which is the 14th. The council has a work session the day following, essentially to absorb public input, uh, do final look at the CIP or public works, all the other departments. Thanks, Brad. Public works, uh, all the other departments, uh, CIPs have been reviewed already. Uh, I think we know why public works went so short yesterday. I think maybe we did equipment normally during their operations, but we'll still have equipment because that's a that that's still a sizable part. But that'll you you won't miss that. It's just that I think that's we're trying to figure out why it went so short, and I think that was uh, why. Uh, be that as it may, we'll be able to do all that. We we're scheduled to go from five until seven, I believe, that day, and I think we can. Uh, what day is it? That is Wednesday, November. 15th, it's the day after the regular council meeting. Uh, but we do typically hold the public hearing on the budget, and I think we've already noticed that. Yes. Or we will have this noticed Saturday. that. This Saturday. Yeah, that'll be in this Saturday. So that'll be the, uh, the hearing will be on the 14th, and then the, the last work session will be on the, the 15th. And then budget will be scheduled for adoption by uh, November 28th because we need to get the tax bills over to the county probably that week I would imagine by the end of that week or pretty close to it well, we produce the tax bills or we have, we have to get to get all the other numbers ready right yep so uh, for so budget adoption the tax bills you we would anticipate sending out the second week in December that is a, a week later than traditional just because of the budget adoption has pushed out a week later. So we've had three requests for, well, no, two requests for staff, adding two total expense. How do you, we want to address those or is it a- Typically what we do- Do you want us to say, which ones do we support, which ones we don't, how would it affect the impact of the budget or where we, could we cut to cover some of those costs um, how, where do we want to move forward with some of that? Uh, the council at any time can ask us to put something on. It doesn't necessarily have to be what the departments have requested. Something else comes to mind if you want to make any particular proposal to add or delete or uh, in the case of revenues, look at revenue enhancements. You can do any of those times. We'll provide that, that document that we handed out yesterday at the outset. Um, we'll, as, as council members, give that to us. Our goal is to give this to you every Friday, just to give you an update on what you have and what, what you have or haven't done with it right now. Uh, if it was today, we would have a blank form for you on Friday, but that, that'll just be to remind you that it's there. Um, if you want to have a couple minutes, you want to talk about it now, that's fine. Um, or following the public hearing or the work session on the 14th slash 15th, we would do that. And then we would ask that before now, because of Thanksgiving week, the, the agenda is going to be going out on Wednesday evening, not Friday. Um, so we'll have the last, the last version of this you'll have in your packet on Wednesday evening, the day before Thanksgiving. And that'll pretty much be the script from which council can work on because we couldn't ask <coughs> council to take votes on any of those things until you were there at the meeting on the 28th. Um, but the more we know about before the meeting, the more we can prepare information so you can make those decisions. So there were several enhancements that the, uh, uh, the departments had placed in there. There's also the list of cuts that were there. Obviously, those are very difficult reductions, um, but they're all there, and council had requested those, and we wanted to make sure. But those were cuts there. were not figured into what we have. Correct. Yeah, those were, if... If we had to. If we had to, those are things that you could look at. Right now, we're at a 3.9% levy increase. Uh, we didn't talk a lot about the revenues, but I think the budget message covers a lot of that. Happy to answer any questions that you might have that came up over the course of that. Um, the state revenues, oddly, in some cases, not shared revenue, but in some cases, were up. Um, all the other revenues are pretty stagnant or low. Shared revenue, zero for 20. We haven't seen an increase in... 20 years, um, which is why the levy is the one that ends up getting pushed. Um, 
half of the levy increases due to debt service, but we talked about that in terms of us going shorter on some of our debt. That's a good thing, but the downside of it is your payments go up. Um, the health insurance helped a, a ton, can't, can't deny that. Um, and ICI is uh, one that's also getting frozen again. That's free money. That's the council can do whatever they wish with that. That can either be that or was how much? 61,000. 61, so uh, levy reduction add to um, uh, the e equipment. Uh, I won't say equipment replacement because I don't want to mislead you on that. It's really more just putting down payment on uh, capital equipment, those types of things. Or ICI is restricted to capital. Not no, operating. it's not. It, I'm just suggesting that that 61000 can be used for one of three things. And I'm, I'm just generalizing. It can be used for whatever purposes, but either levy reduction or put more money into capital because that's really putting more cash, restoring that level because we've been at a million dollars. We knocked it down to about, about 900000 maybe a little less than that. So to get it back up, we'd need about 100000 That would get you 60 of it there. Um, or thirdly, you could review uh, one of the enhancements. So those are kind of your three um, options with that extra But to money. move the needle, so to speak, on the levy, doesn't it have to be something like in the upper $300,000 range to even move that levy number down? We just gave you that as a, a base number to think through. A 1% reduction in the levy means 363 thousand you can move it as much or as little we're just giving you an idea of what a full percent of the levy is 300 some odd thousand um, you can move it as little or as much as you want so I don't know if council wants to have this conversation now or later but I guess I would just be interested in the, the first enhancement that we were, was brought to our attention was from admin services on the full-time HR generalist um, and it sounded like John was saying they really expected that that would be a full-time need but if we were I mean I, I can't imagine he would say no to a half-time person um, it would just be a matter of how you pull it off and I guess that would be a question if we did this how would you envision implementing that? So I get, you know, and those are legitimate questions for council to ask staff at the uh, meeting on the 14th mm -hmm. um, or uh, at the. Uh, well, I guess there's a, a work session on the 15th. Big pound grill in the room, I guess, is we end up with an agreement with Corp. The golf course closes. We got staff there. We got equipment there. We got. We gonna. Yeah, I yeah, mean, have do we do we do we hang on to stuff? I mean, obviously, we don't do wholesale get rid of because we don't know what's going to happen with the remainder of the golf course. But at the same time, um, how are we going to deal with that? I mean, yeah. that's really going to be decided. I mean, in some cases, part of that could be decided before we even approve the budget. So Ray has. You know, Ray's aware that he'll have to have a transition plan. What, what we transition to is really the question. Um, in terms of, you know, if there's discussion about continuing with a nine-hole golf course, then we really have to hold off on doing much of anything, although staffing-wise, that might be a difficult thing to hang on to people. That's just a reality. That's why, you know, my, my hats were off the... It was an Price. awkward position today to even talk about it. Yeah, but they've been. Yeah. Oh, okay. Aware. Yeah, that's that's what they're saying. aware of it. Just awkward because it's like we're planning a budget, but it could be no budget, or it could be a partial budget, or it could be half a budget. You know, I mean. In the scheme of things, we'd have to wind down uh, that fund one way or the other. Um, council have to give direction on uh, paying off whatever debts exist whatever obligations exist. And those include the lease payment that was discussed as well as uh, prepaid memberships. There are people who have already prepaid their memberships for 2018. Those types of things we'll have to account for um, right off the top um, before we do anything. 
Um, but then we're going to need, uh, I think we're going to need some input from the Parks Advisory Board because what's next? Um, and I think that that's got to be the, the first thing. Um, you know, we dealt with this similarly a few years ago when we uh, disbanded the, the health, health department. department. And essentially what we did was w when we know what we're going to do, then we make the change to the budget. Otherwise, just because you have a budget doesn't mean you necessarily spend it or do anything with it. Um, we had a full budget for the health department and we never, we just never implemented it. I knew enough that I wasn't going to be approving things left and right for a health department. Similarly, I wouldn't be making a bunch of expenditures for golf. Um, I think it would help if the Parks Board got going on it. Um, if, you know, I think Christmas time is a little much to ask, but right after the first of the year, I think the Parks Board needs to start discussing those types of things because people are going to be anxious and want to know from you what, what types of things are going to get done. Um, the proceeds, we'll know what the net proceeds are by then, and then we can start talking about that. Um, in the scheme of things, and in the scheme of a $110 million budget, it's it's $1 million operating budget. It's not a huge amount, but obviously it's an important policy issue for, for the okay. community, even though it's not a big budget area. Because we're not, I'm not an accountant by any means, and let's just say I want to look at, at these enhancements, and let's just say we go forward with the uh, admin human resource generalist. Uh, Chief Smith requested another police officer. Concern I have with that, even though I think we need police officers, that would be two years in a row we've added police officers and nothing to the fire department, and yet calls for services continue to go up at the fire department. Ambulance calls, so it's so. And our, our firemen are across trains, so they're paramedics and firefighters. So I'm almost feeling that with the growth of the city, especially on the southwest side and some of the other things, apartments being added that I would myself comfortably I'd like to improve all three positions but that being said where do we make maybe some cuts or adjustments I wouldn't even know where to begin well the cuts would I mean you know I mean those you know, we cuts. can't we can't you you had said earlier we can't say you can't take something like from the CIP and say no we're gonna move it over to operation you can't do that so where within the operations could we you know somehow cover those types of expenses you know Plus the chief, you know, the chief also wants this um, uh, software package, which I, I think is beneficial. Again, it, it enhances our police department, enhances our services to our citizens, and things like that, but that's another cost. So I guess. Well, we do have the 61,000. Yeah. We have the 61,000. Right, that, I mean, but that doesn't even fund the position. Would that, doesn't even fund would that give us a firefighter? The 61? No, I, I would think the firefighter and police are pretty much close to the same, right? You're talking right, about 80 to 100,000. Yeah, eight, this is 86 with benefits. Yeah, you'd probably be right in that ballpark with a firefighter. Did I understand but, the chief right about the school liaison officers that he is, they would be dropped? Or are they, well, are they, what, are they in the budget? The or council is, asked us in the budget. to give suggestions if we needed to make cuts, what would they be? So every department provided something in that regard. These are these these items are not cut. They are in the budget. They are they are offered up here. So if you wanted to make cuts, here's where you have to here's choose where, from. Here's, here's your menu of cuts. But if you would ask the, you know, police department, would you make these cuts for that? My I would submit to you that if they wanted to do that, they would have come in and just suggested that they do that. These are not cuts that they want in place of an addition in their department. Because if you reduce an officer and you add an officer, yeah, I think we need those officers in the schools. I do too, and I think that that's more so critical. now I than ever. I, I think taking officers out of the school would be a, a real detriment. Um, but you know, all of these cuts that you proposed cuts that you gave us really are service impacts, in my opinion. If you really look at them, and again. Where do you cut in services? You know, sometimes you can say, you know, we're we're we're, we're top heavy here or we're heavy here. Um, really, these these would have impacts immediately onto our service side of what we provide to our citizens. I mean, but but with the public works, for example, um, the reducing fuel or sodium chloride, they're like conservative estimates of what they need. That's also a gamble. Right, sure, we, we, could, we could end up mm -hmm. having like some freak winter, mm -hmm. 
and then be 2008 right I got here and it was like our budgets were already busted in the winter I didn't even, it was still summer I mean I guess our, our I, salt budget was I guess if there's job. one one budget item that maybe I could, would, would, would be the number nine the unclassified reduce or eliminate the budget for outside council now granted we've had some issues over the years and we've had to have outside council but I mean it really doesn't have a huge impact but it would have some impact on the levy because it's 37 uh, would bring the levy down a little bit but it just you know when you look at all the other ones I, I don't support taking street cold taking out more street lights nope. we've already so we got issues um, you know, contract services under community development. Probably. Well, we could look there. Um, I do think that sometimes we could do a little more in-house. Um, maybe spend a little less money on consultants in that area. Um, you know, uh, landscaping supplies, I don't see that as a real, you know. It, Most of these are service reductions if right. you want to have a, a real cut because right you, know, you could you say just well let's take our chances with fuel and sodium chloride but that'll come back one <laughs> mm -hmm. day and then you'll be you'll unless be you do, unless you don't do it for that full amount i mean what i what i kind of hear council member herman saying is we could do kind of a hybrid of partial combinations from some of these right without totally reducing those services Correct. These are not. These are. These are. That type of thing is not an all or nothing. Um, when you're talking about a, a reduction, you're just taking a chance on those things. I know, right. council. Uh, and we've done that a few times, even on the on the one year. I think we moved some money from bike pet to something else, and we moved. You know, I mean that can happen, but still, when I'm thinking of adding three full time positions to our table organization, that's probably a lifetime commitment to to that situation because you're going to have that position on table organization yeah, that's yeah, not I'm sorry, did taxes we have will have an impact yet? differently on did people that was yesterday we did i missed it in the morning no we did it at the end of the um right before end lunch of the day. end of the oh. day we did it we had yeah. a little time today but I, I guess so i'm thinking we did as not being the account I. professional not wanting to put more on your plate trina i guess if there's a consensus of council that We'd like to add these positions. Where would we find the money? Because last year we got caught kind of a little bit in the afterthought that when we approved those three positions for the police department, all of a sudden. In haste, yeah. yeah where where'd where the money going to come from now? Well, and let I don't want to do that this year. Stop right now. We don't need, we can't do the three enhancements and still stay within expenditure restraint. That's the other issue. We got to, we're, how much room do we have in expenditure restraint? So we have a, about 170000 Now, with that said, that's 100, 100 said we could increase by 170 Yeah. So we could increase by 170 For every dollar you want to go over 170 you've got to cut something. Now, does that, 170 include the ICI? Yes. Okay, so we've got 170 that we could add in overall expenditures um, without hitting the expenditure, or before we hit this expenditure restraint wall. So that's really the that's what's the net, or not even the net, that's the, that's the gross expenditure you can go up. I would look uh, at the one position in police and one in fire and skip human resources. It has nothing you, to do with Public safety. It's Let's just say everything costs. You said one seventy. One seventy. Yep. One seventy. Mm -hmm. Let's just say everything costs two hundred thousand. What you could do is to get to that two hundred thousand is you got one seventy in room before you hit the cap, so you're okay there. You'd have to cut thirty, so you know twenty from fuel and ten from consultants. Right. I mean, there there are there is no all or nothing thing here. Uh, I don't think for any of those except when you're starting to talk. About, position it's all or nothing but the ones well, if you're, if you're is it though around we the have, edge. in the past we have ramped up by starting with a part-time and then you know the addition of you, that full you can time. but the impact of uh, but you can't you can't add a part-time police or a part-time no no i'm i guess no, I'm, I'm referring I think to, the HR, to hr but the HR but even there though that you know we had a request last year which we didn't fall uh do with um, a diversity, diversity coordinator. coordinator. This position is, it is, appears to be looking at some yeah. of those issues. So again, that's a, that's an enhancement. I agree, it's not public safety, but 
it's an enhancement to our economic development our whole overall wellness and growth in the city of Oshkosh as we move forward in the future whether it's more diversity more uh, labor force more whatever that we want to get a more diversified workforce we've talked about that for years that it would you know it, there's enhancements to having that diversified workforce what so, I'm hearing is put them all on put them all in here because no. you're not the purpose of this the, this is a great discussion the purpose isn't to make the decisions but right. the purpose it's, is to get everything out on the table yeah how we how can we fit about. some of this into our budget without impacting too much of our service delivery to our citizens at the same time but I think the need is there in police and fire for sure because as the chief was say, fire chief was saying this morning he anticipates or feels that this city will need another ambulance ambulance out into the service unit in the next five to six years I don't think we can hit in our budget six officers at one time six firefighters so how do you get there in the next five that's a kind of that long-range yeah. planning you know to think about you know because that's that's important public service public safety and streets and sidewalks to me are the most important thing that we do to, for citizens in our community well Trina it doesn't take I mean it takes some time to plug those numbers in but you're not the one thing I could suggest to the mm -hmm. council is what if on week one your sheet you receive Monday it excuse me Friday it has one police and one fire and then we will propose the offset mark and i will work through the offset my suggestion on fire with all due respect to chief franz in a year you're gonna have a new chief i don't think the result will be any different to be honest with you i think any responsible chief is probably going to tell you exactly what tim told you today but we haven't added i mean we haven't added to the fire department since 2003. that's 14 years we've gone with I'm the not same amount of staff and yet but let you know, Trina do her work no, rather than debating it let her do the numbers for a reason and the chief didn't put in for a reason because that's for the next chief to deal with but couldn't we, you say in five years from now they're going to even need more than they need right now adding one well I think I think I think you're moving towards you're moving towards a functional decision to expand service and that's got to be a plan not just adding a body it's got to be a, a plan that's what I'm saying. Yeah, he plan. said even adding one ambulance we need to add multiple it that to be honest ambulance. you yeah. you also heard him if you were going to add a position he would have asked for it. I I'd, I'd say add a battalion chief they are so shorthanded on covering and supervising shifts and well, he didn't ask for it though either he didn't ask for any of them he didn't ask for a fire a fire officer right. either. If you were going to do it, but, yeah, but you would be on the about. bottom side. You'd, you'd end up promoting somebody from within to that battalion chief. And you bring you wouldn't be hiring. You wouldn't be you wouldn't be hiring outside the higher battalion chief. So you'd still hire that entry level firefighter to allow him to bump someone up to battalion chief. I mean, you'd have a you'd have an increase in salary, but you would still have that opportunity. Well, let's not try to run the fire department. Do the numbers. And then we can make a decision. Can you also give us what it looks like for the um, HR position too? Yep. Give you two perspectives. One with. Oh yeah, we can ask him about that. Yeah, that. I think we've that, got the sheet. Yeah. So do you want one police officer with one battalion chief? Or no, do you want one was policeman and one fireman, and then? alternate all three positions yes yes and you would do you want it fully funded with the utilization of cuts or why don't we let's not why don't, let's not go there sure. let's just, just give, put everything we, on the sheet we here's some here's, responsibility as well to go here. home and look at this and, and what we want to see as well so here. we have a little bit of work right yeah we can give you our we can offer up options because the first thing the limitation is we can't exceed expenditure as strong. No, we can't. Right. So that's just that. And I guess the other direction I'd like to <coughs> counsel is where are you comfort wise in terms of the levy? Because the levy drives this too. Um, the levy's at 3.9. There was a somewhat conscious effort to keep it, you know, it's 3.9 for a reason. 
Um, but that's still, everybody has a different comfort zone. Somebody might say 3.9 I, rounds up to four for me. I mean, every, so that you're going to have to think about too. And, and I guess I'd, I'd, I'd I leave it out there. I was surprisingly comfortable with 3.9 right now, right now. Well, the impact on homeowners will be different too picture. because of the, the assessment on homes. It's going to be different for a lot of people. A lot of people are going to go down. A lot of going to, people are going to go up. What was the average about 3% increase? And no, the, no, the average newer, is, are the is newer almost homes. zero. Oh, okay. So, I mean, even amongst department heads, they're like, mine's going up, mine's going down. And amongst the council, um, going down. are going up, some are going up, some are going down, and some are kind of staying still. Um, that you're going to see a lot. And, you know, People aren't probably paying much attention to it. They're hearing 3.9%. Well, it might be 3.9% for some, but for others, it's going to be 10, and others, it's going to be a reduction. As weird as that sounds, that's that's the reality. I was going through an old desk for the couple past the weekends ago, and I came across a tax bill from the 90s. I was paying more then than I'm paying now. Same house, same everything. But what I'm so I'm not hearing much in terms of the, the tax, so we're going to kind of hold that, keep that in a holding pattern in terms of presenting options for you, give you some uh, expenditure options, and basically let you know what you're getting into. If you if you were to do everything you just talked about, what that would mean for you, now that would take you over. It just would take you over. At least they don't get you thinking about that. Um, I just had one more question. Like Chief Franz said that a lot of the guys are going to be retiring in the next 25 guys. In the next five years, or that's what they're five a year is not is not is, I mean, is reasonable. Those expected. wage reductions are probably going to be at least twenty percent, won't they be? They would will, cover one person on each. five people retiring would be one added. At the very position. bottom, yeah, they mm -hmm. move up fairly quickly. We did a few years ago. We negotiated a lower starting point. We didn't change the upper point, but we started. It was a lower start, but it takes stayed. three years to get to top pay, right? Yeah, yeah, and it was it was a year and a half before. So it stretched it out a little bit. It, I mean, it gave us benefit. That was good. Um, but in three years, they're back up to the top again. It, it doesn't take that long. Um, and virtually, be, because of the wage compression we have, when we replace one BC with another BC, they're almost identical. So really, the only real savings you get are, is way at the at the bottom. But that's where you start. Everybody. You know, whatever vacancy happens in the fire department, there's a vacancy at firefighter, you know, because everybody bumps up, and that's with real savings. How many city employees are there non-fire police? Well, there's 550 full-time employees, give or take. Um, there's 100 in uh, fire, 125 in police. Those aren't all <coughs> um, that's a rough idea um, of how many people we have there. So that's a good, you know, uh, Forty percent of our workforce. Do you have the direction you need, Trina? I think we're good. I think we'll, we'll, you'll get the you get the whole menu uh, this Friday. You'll know exactly what it is, and then you can start looking at that cut sheet, and and we'll start looking at it too in terms of you know getting you to because you send that you go into the max. Can you on, send that electronically too? Because I'm going to be out of town, but I'll have computer access. Yeah, we can do that. That'd be great. All right. Let's go home and welcome little goblins and ghosts. And Thank you. Thank you. Good Thank job. You. Giving your days up. <laughs>